Good morning, everybody. Um, I see we've got quite a few participants joining now, so we'll, we'll kick off. I'll just do the introduction while we're waiting for a few more people to attend. So I would like to welcome you all to the 58th annual weed review. And this year our theme is integrated weed management. It's not just about weeds. Um, as you realise, we're, we're still virtual um, due to continuing restrictions with numbers at the proposed venue we have. So um, thank you all of you for, for joining us online this year. Many of you will remember that integrated weed management was also the theme of last year's review, but um, from the feedback received via our questionnaire, it was clear that this was a topic for further discussion. Um, by the way, I probably just introduced myself at the beginning. I'm Nicola Perry, I'll be your chair today um, from Corteva AgriScience. Let me just share the agenda. So we are, our first speaker this morning will be uh, Peter Luckman, who's going to do a review of the weather summary for the year. And then we move on to um, Alistair Leake, who's going to be talking about farming systems, soil management and weeds, and a holistic approach to crop production. Then on to Gary Willoughby, who's going to be giving us a farmer perspective of IWM. And then Henry Christen and Holly Clarkson are going to be speaking on barriers and enablers to IPM adoption. And then we've got a, a, a seeds standards session from um, Stephen Flack and Richard Barnes, and then a student poster slot and the poster slides will be shown over lunch. And then we'll pick up in the afternoon with a, a short piece on the BCPC database from Barry Hunt, and then modeling the effects of glyphosate loss in no-till and plow-based systems from Helen Metcalf. And then we're gonna have a, an IWM elements and amenity session from Brian Taylor and then finishing up um, with IWM strategies and tactics that UK arable farmers are employing, and that will be with Richard Hull from Rothamsted. So just go through a few housekeeping um, pieces. So all attendees should have been muted, and the speakers will be on mute and the camera off when they're not presenting, but um, hopefully you'll um, put your camera on when you're presenting or taking part in panel discussions. Um, obviously, we are virtual, but we'd like to make the day as interactive as possible. So please, can you submit questions for today's speakers using the Q&A function on Zoom? Um, if you can start your question with the speaker's name so that during the discussion session, I'll know who to um, direct the, your question to, that would be very helpful. And we'll aim for the speakers to answer your questions live during the discussion sessions, except in the PhD um, virtual poster session where the questions will be answered um, via the Q&A feature over lunchtime. Uh, the session is being recorded and it will be available on the BCPC website. Um, please expect a bit of delay um, for editing into the separate speaker videos before it's being placed on the website. Um, the chat function, if you have any um, technical issues with, with Zoom, then please use the, the chat function and we'll try our best to help resolve it. But if you can use the, um, the Q&A function for, for all um, questions to the speakers. Okay, so first up, um, we've got um, Peter Luckman, who I'm sure many of you will know. Peter spent um, over 30 years working in the public sector into research on arable weeds and um, biology and control at WRO, Long Ashton, and then on to Rothamsted. His work mainly focused on cereals and oilseed rape, um, and lastly, the environmental impact of weed control. Peter's been retired for, for a, a little while, um, so he says his weed activities have declined, but he still keeps an active interest in the subject. And he's also very interested in the weather and has presented the weather report at a, a number of weed reviews. Um, we admitted to, um, to have the weather re report last year, um, but due to popular demand, um, Peter is back. So Peter, if you'd like to start sharing your screen and over to you for the weather report. Today's meeting. Um, well, I hope that the report on the weather for last year will help everybody to put some of the discussions we're having on crop management and weed control in the context of what the weather was actually like um, in the last 12 months. <clears throat> so 
There we go. There we go. Um, anomaly maps are what the weather report is based on. These are produced by the Met Office. What they do is compare the weather every month with the mean temperature over the 30 year period from 81 to 2010. Um, I'm going to show you temperature and rainfall. The map, if the map is blue, then it, uh, it um, tells you it's going to be cold. And if it's red, it shows it's going to be hot. And when it comes to rainfall, if it's blue, it's wet, as you can see from these pictures. And if it's brown, it is going to be dry. It was dry. So we're now looking at September to December 20. And you can see that September and October were pretty average as far as temperatures were concerned. But uh, the rainfall was rather different. September started dry, and which enabled the finish of harvest 2020 and the beginnings of cultivations for the crop establishment for 21. And then in October, it was a bit wetter, particularly as you can see in the southeast and in the west of Scotland. Then if we go into November, November was a quite a warm month. It was warmer than average everywhere in the country. But the rainfall was definitely had an east-west split and it was dry in the east and about average in the west. Then in December, um, the weather was, the temperature was pretty much average, although it was slightly warmer in Scotland. But the rainfall was again east west split with a lot of rain in the east of Scotland, in the south, and in, in the Midlands and the east of England. You may recall there were floods at Christmas time in the Midlands and in East Anglia. So, will you do the next one, Richard? Thank you. January. January was on the cold side, particularly in Scotland. And then as the rainfall follows that a little bit in that Scotland was drier than average and the west and the west of England was fairly dry, but east was wetter. In February, the, the weather was warmer in the southeast and in the south and the rainfall was fairly patchy and there's no particular pattern there. Dry in the north of Scotland if you happen to live there. Then March turns up warm and it, it was a good auger for the start of the spring. It wasn't very dry, it wasn't very wet. As you can see the majority of the country is on the brown side so therefore rainfall was less than average. We then go into the standout month weather-wise for this season, and that was the cold, cold, dry April. Almost no rain and really very cold. If you're a uh, meteorological geek, it was the driest year since nine, April since 1980 and the coldest since 1989. And if you're really into these things, it's the fourth driest April since 1862, and the second coldest since 1884. So it really was cold and not very, uh, and not very wet. And then a lot of places got no rain at all. Right, next slide, Richard, please. So we then go into May. May stayed cold, as you can see, it's that light blue color, but the rain came back and that helped um, late crop establishment and helped the crops to recover. June and July were the warm months of the summer, as you can see, warmer than average. It didn't rain much in June, except a little bit in the southeast, and July was fairly average, except in the west, in the west coast of Scotland, which was drier. As we went into harvest in August, people were a bit concerned because the land was still pretty wet. Um, but as the month progressed, as you will see, August was brown, generally, or white, 
um, the weather, the land dried out and harvest was able to make progress. On, on the temperature side, Scotland was fairly warm, but the south of England was particularly cold. And as I said, June and July were the warmer months of the year. We have the next slide, please, Richard. Um, this is all 12 months on one page. What I want you to do is to compare the, the number of blue months and the number of pink months, or the blue months and the brown months. You can see here that we're probably six months look on the pink side were warmer than average and only three were on the cold side. On the weather, uh, the rainfall, it's much more patchy, um, but it looks to me as though there were four brown months, which were drier than average and six, six wet months. So overall, it was an unsettled year with locally variable wet and dry spells. You can see from these patchy rainfall maps along the bottom two rows. Um, it wasn't clearly the warmer than average. When I've done this in previous years, the number of pink years has been considerably higher and there haven't been many blue years. So it wasn't a particularly warm year last year at all. Next slide, please. So overall view, a benign autumn followed by an unexceptionable winter, though there were storms at times. The spring started very dry and cold and the cold continued into, into May, but then the rain came back and the run up to harvest, the weather was unsettled, which delayed the start, but then things improved. Overall, I think the year could be classed as unsettled. Now the Met Office records a large number of floods and incidents of storm damage. I don't know whether that is the case that it's getting worse or whether the Met Office are more assiduous in recording these events now. But if you look at the website and, and uh, investigate in a bit more detail, there are quite a lot of examples of floods and storms. The standout feature, as already mentioned, was the cold, dry April, followed by the cold and wet May. Next slide. Um, so we had a reasonable autumn for crop establishment. The cold, dry spring delayed crop growth. It stopped the wheat growing for as, as quickly as it should do. Delayed development. It posed problems for spring crop establishment. It was cold and it was dry. And there was a lot of damage to fruit crops. I've just come back from the Champagne region of France. They are not a happy lot of growers there. They had a really bad year because of the spring frost in April. As far as the UK was concerned, the run up to harvest was rather too unsettled that people, than people would have liked. But the weather improved as August progressed and harvest was reasonably satisfactory. There were reasonable grain yields. The Met Office has just the Met Office, the DEFRA have just announced that the UK wheat yield was 14 million tons, which is roughly the same as 2019 and considerably better than 2020. I think there's one more slide, Richard, and then that's it. Julian, I mean, one more slide. No, never mind. That's about it. That's all I've got to say, I think, about the weather. If you've got any questions, then yeah, there's more let me know. The Thank you very much, Peter. And so now, next up, we have got uh, Dr. Alistair Leek, who is um, Director of Policy at the Game and, the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust's Allerton Project. Um, now, Alistair has spent many years developing holistic approaches to um, production that maximise yields and biodiversity whilst minimising their environmental impacts. And so now Alistair is going to talk to us on um, holistic approaches in crop production. Thank you very much. Over to you, Alistair. And please okay. keep your um, questions coming in on the Q&A feature. That's great. Thank, thank you very much for that, uh, Nicola. And thank you, Peter, for that uh, really interesting introduction to the weather. Um, I'm trusting you can all see my screen and hear me okay? 
Yes, we can. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much. So um, I've spent about 30 years looking at different farming systems from a fairly holistic point of view. Uh, and I'm going to go through uh, my experiences, really, of the things that we've done over that period of time and, and, and what we've learned um, from, from that. Um, so um, the systems I've been involved in uh, are, are these ones listed here, the, the mixed organic farming systems are, are quite novel and innovative and actually quite controversial when we started it back in 1988, uh, an all arable approach to organic farming. And, and out of that became a, a big growth in integrated farm management and, and the whole uh, leaf uh, concept of uh, approaching production. And was quite a lot of comparison done at that time with what was concerned, uh, what known as conventional farming, which was basically aiming at maximizing uh, production. And I won't say a lot about conventional farming because I'm assuming really you all know that. Uh, I'll then move on and look at the conservation agriculture movement uh, and, and how that manages weeds within the system. And then just a, a few words on this new trend at the moment of uh, regenerative agriculture. So let's start the story at the very beginning uh, with mixed organic farming. This is really uh, the very basic um, approach to agriculture, which probably goes back really to Turnip Townsend's uh, approach, which was that you have restorative phases of a rotation and you have exploitative phases uh, and you alternate those. So uh, the fertility building phases are based around legumes, uh, grass clover being typical. Um, but also within the arable phase, we, we, we try to insert um, a grain legume into that because that helps to provide additional fertility. I mean, what, what limits the output of any organic farming system is, is basically nitrogen, the availability of nitrogen within the system. Um, and, and so if you can build it in at any point, then, then that's always helpful. Um, in a mixed farming system, you have the added benefit of farmyard manure. That means you can move nitrogen from the uh, from the, the lay period into the arable period. Quite clearly, the livestock are going to manure the fields while they're at grass. Uh, but while, while they're in the sheds over winter, they're producing fertilizer, which can be redistributed through the rotation uh, into, into the uh, arable phase to provide fertility. Um, our, our trials were really looking at how we how hard we could push these rotations uh, to try and get the maximum economic output. And I think it's fair to say that we found really the, the soil type and condition uh, and the weed pressure along with the availability of nitrogen really determines the length of the arable phase. And I had two sites which I worked on. One was, uh, uh, one was a, a farm based between the village of Cold Newton and Hungerton here in Leicestershire. I think the names of the villages perhaps give some hint to the inherent agricultural productivity of the land. Um, and the other farm which was on a lighter soil type and certainly the the better soil type enabled us to, to, to push uh, a longer rotation and, and, and make it more, more profitable. Um, so during this uh, phase, we, 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 we set up a, a model rotation, which basically took us for three years of uh, grass white clover to winter wheat, winter oats, winter beans, uh, then back into wheat again. And then we would try to under sow that last cereal crop in the rotation to, to get the grass lay established again. And obviously we varied that rotation in some fields to test out some, some other ideas. Um, one thing I think we, we learned uh, was that control of docks and thistles during the lay period was, was really important. And I think something that I've learned is, is that we, we don't realize the extent to which we are controlling cooch grass and docks and thistles through the use of glyphosate in conventional agriculture to deal with other issues, which means that, that really those weeds are not a problem to us in conventional farming anymore. If you look back in history, they, they were absolutely major problems for agriculture. And so a kind of byproduct of glyphosate use uh, for, for other weed issues, uh, be it stale seed beds or, or indeed uh, pre-harvest desiccation, is actually helping to control those weeds at the same time. An important part of uh, um, 
mixed organic farming is in the cereal period is to delay drilling until the, the soil temperatures have dropped, which the theory is this reduces the amount of uh, weed germination. And I would suggest from my observations, that's absolutely the case. That does give you quite a nice wide window from when you harvest to when you drill, uh, in which you can do a whole series of stale seedbeds uh, and hopefully work the seed bank down through germination and destruction. Uh, and then when you come in to sow in mid-November, um, doubling the seed rate um, to create a really uh, competitive crop was extremely helpful. One thing I discovered about drilling out of sync with everybody else in the county is that when you're the only field of wheat that's just been drilled, you get everybody else's rooks and crows coming and digging up your seed. Uh, so that's a particular problem with, 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 uh, with being the only farm that's got fresh seed in the ground. Uh, when, when everybody is drilling, there's, 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 there's plenty of places for the, the rooks and the crows to go um, to, to, to get their food. And then having attempted to uh, deplete the seed bank of, of, of seeds that are going to germinate, creating a competitive crop structure, we then have the options to, to go in and, and mechanically control weed in, in the spring if conditions allow that. Uh, we also tried, it, tried some a novel approach to reduce uh, weed germination at drilling uh, by trying to exclude light from the seedbed. Uh, I had to dig deep for this picture and it's not very good, but you'll get a, uh, the drift of what we're trying to do. Th this is a one pass seed drill underneath, uh, underneath that canopy. It's basically a, a soil loosener, rotivator, uh, sower and packer all in one machine. Uh, and what we did with this machine was we, we covered it up with a cowl uh, to try and exclude light uh, at the drilling phase. Many weeds obviously are stimulated to germinate by, by, by light. Um, but what was really technologically advanced uh, about this approach was we borrowed, borrowed some military hardware um, in the form of, of night vision goggles, which allowed the tractor driver to, to use an, uh, a cowl like this and drill at night at the same time, uh, and also, very importantly, stay in the field, uh, not drive through the hedge at the other end, because uh, he needs to see where, where he was going. And, um, and interestingly, we, we did record uh, an effect from this, and apologies again, this is not a very good uh, very visible slide, but, but basically, um, your, your, the left-hand two bars, yellow and blue, are, are, are drilling during the daytime, and the right is the drilling at night, and the yellow is the, the weed emergence with the cowl, and the, the blue is the emergence without. And you can see that, that, that there is a slight reduction uh, where we've used the cowl, and there's also a slight reduction where we've used the cowl and done it at night. Um, so obviously uh, some effect taking place there, but unfortunately not enough of an effect to prevent a weed problem. Um, so uh, really, you know, this is something that perhaps could be used in conjunction with all the other measures that we look at. And I think that's probably really the, the lessons I learned most about organic farming was if you use a, a wide range of control measures, sequentially suppressing weeds at every opportunity that you get, that was really the best way to stay on top of them. Uh, unlike using a herbicide where, where, you, where you can effectively kill all the weeds in one go, um, this really quite requires a, a very much a stepwise uh, approach to what we're doing. Uh, we, we also found that there were difficulties of weeds carried over from, from the, the, the grass phase. Things like chickweed will, will grow in a, in a grass ward and, and seed and then become a problem uh, in the subsequent uh, arable crop. Um, here, here it's quite useful actually to use mechanical uh, weeders uh, and, and that's what we did. This is the, uh, this is the harricone weed, uh, harricone weeder. I remember vividly the first time I used this in a crop of winter beans, very similar to the picture that you see here on the screen. I did about 30 metres and then I looked behind myself uh, out of the back of the tractor window to witness a scene of 
devastation. Uh, and I went back to the office and I, I called a chap called Dr. Vic Jordan, who many of you older ladies and gentlemen will know, who ran the life experiment at Long Ashton. Uh, he'd been doing mechanical weeding in beans for some time. And I said, Vic, I, I've looked behind me and the scene is one of devastation. He said, I know exactly what you're doing wrong. I said, what was that? He said, don't look behind you. And I think that actually was sound advice because the, the beans will actually survive this harrowing, providing you do it before the stems go hollow. What well, Once the stems go hollow, they do break off. But if you get them before that, they actually, uh, they, they do okay. But um, again, it, it, it's not the be all and end all. Um, it's really only effective when the soil surface is dry. Um, cereals are definitely more resilient to the operation than, than, than broadleaf crops. And as I say, the timing of that is, is very important. Um, I suspect it's in an organic system, some mineralization of nitrogen is also uh, very useful. Um, but I think the most important thing that I, I, I found was that, that um, these hurricane weeders become, if you use them um, continuously, that they, they do become rather selective. In, in other words, th th they are very effective at pulling out trailing weeds like, like cleavers and chickweed and speedwell, but they're less good at pulling out tap uh, rooted uh, plants. And it was quite interesting over the 10 years in which we, we ran this, um, it was noticeable how where we were using, constantly using the mechanical weeder, the, the tap rooted weeds started to prevail in, in those fields at the expense of the, of the trailing ones. And I suppose that's not really a surprise to us because we know that's exactly how uh, these things work. If it survives and seeds, then the seed bank builds up and the, 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 the problem becomes bigger. And then the other approach you can use is, is uh, using interrow harrows. Um, the, these are pretty non-selective. They rely on slicing the, the, the weed off. Um, very important to drive in a straight line because they are equally effective at take, taking the crop out as they are in taking the taking the weeds out. Uh, and um, they can be quite damaging to wildlife, particularly um, if you think about um, uh, an interhoe crop, it's quite an open crop. Uh, and that's exactly the sort of crop that you'll find skylarks nesting in because they'd like to have a, a bit more space. Uh, and quite clearly then when you go through with the hoe, you will going to damage those, those nests you go through. We, we also did some work to see how wide you could go. Obviously, the wider you go, the faster you can drive the tractor because the wobble on the machine is less critical uh, in terms of taking the crop out. Um, so really, you can drill cereals up to 20 centimetres without the yield starting to wobble. Once you go up to 25, yes, you do start to see uh, uh, in, in some crops, uh, not every year, not every crop, but some of them will start to show a small yield, uh, yield reduction in, in that circumstance. So... Um, so that's a that's a picture of a uh, interroho uh, a machine in in action. Um, we we also um, did some work on some novel crops within the organic system. Um, there was a a feeling that uh, organic uh, livestock producers needed a, a, a source of grain uh, protein other than soya, uh, and so we looked at we looked at lupins, um, and so we we interho we interrohoed this crop of lupins uh, and it worked really, really well. But unfortunately, the stems of the lupin are, are, are quite fleshy. Uh, and the result of that was there was a, a bit of damage through the crop when we did the operation. And, and that damage led to botrytis getting into the crop. And I think that this is, this is one, one of the first crops uh, I grew as a farmer. And, and it is not my most successful one. When, when what's in the combine tank at the end of harvest is less than was in the seed bag that you put in the ground at the beginning you know that your career as a farmer is not going to be successful if you continue in that way. Um, so not a, not a good start. Uh, and I don't think anybody else yet has cracked the cultivation of lupins organically um, here in the UK. Uh, we did some work with Nick Tillett uh, and, and Silso um, to try and use some precision guidance in these uh, interrow hoes. This is their, their uh, robo uh, hoe, um, uh, which, which was great because it did mean that you could hoe faster and being able to get more weed done in better conditions was 
uh, was very useful. And we also adapted this machine um, to help us in some conventional uh, vegetable crops we were growing at the time. Um, a particular problem controlling charlock in Calabrese. Um, Charlock doesn't compete with Calabrese in terms of reducing yield. This is an issue of quality. Um, the, the petals shed from, from the, the Charlock and land on the top of the Calabrese head. And when they're shrink wrapped and go into the supermarket, uh, that dead petal tissue uh, gets botrytis and then causes uh, the, the, the Calabrese head to, to rot. Um, so being able to mechanically remove the charlock because calabrese are planted on a grid square approach so you, you can you can hoe in in both directions and take out the the, the charlock that's growing between the plants we found was was very useful and doing exactly the same thing also with cauliflower and fat hen fat hen um, sheds its seed into the cauliflower curd and again when it's shrink wrapped to, to go into supermarkets it very much looks like uh, caterpillar excrement which uh, consumers find um, unpalatable um, so um, just some other things that came out of that work that we did on uh, mechanical weeders so that deals really pretty well with the uh, with this with the organic conventional mixed system um, we also had a look at an all arable uh, organic system, which actually I, I think has huge amounts of merit, um, even to this day. Uh, the, the problem for uh, conventional arable farmers is that the transition to an organic system that requires livestock in it is going to be hugely difficult to do and, and very, very costly. Um, in terms of you know, providing water supply to fields and, and the fencing, you've got all the issues of animal um, uh, movement sheets and ear tags and veterinary medicine uh, records and probably providing a house for the stockman and um, NVZ regulations uh, because of the manure and so on and so on and so on. The, 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 there's a score of reasons why uh, conventional farmers would find it hard to go organic. However, going into an all arable system is actually very easy. Um, and there, there, there was at the time when we were doing this huge demand for organic cereals because there was such a shortage in the country. So, so basically your mower or your topper replaces the stock. And, and what you do is instead of feeding leguminous plants to animals that then produce manure, uh, 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 that you feed back to the soil and then that feeds your plants. You, you basically feed the plants directly to the soil and the soil then feeds uh, the crop back um, using a composting or cutting or mulching approach within the field. Uh, the rot rotational principles of this are, are no different from the mixed farming system, except you just eliminate the, the livestock and that does allow you to use red clover. Um, red clover in, in, in interferes with the fertility of livestock, but when you haven't got the livestock, you don't have that problem. And red clover is enormously useful at fixing big quantities of nitrogen. And, and just to give you an example of the um, amount of nitrogen that you can fix through this system, an 18 month ryegrass red clover lay, which was cut and mulched and then plowed down, um, produced a eight ton crop of wheat. Now we know that biologically a crop of wheat requires 23 kilos of nitrogen to produce a ton. So that tells us that the organic supply of nitrogen from that cutting and mulching operation exceeded 220 kilos of nitrogen from that. So it's actually a very efficient way of building fertility in, in soils. And it's something I would very much like to see more people doing um, even, even to this day. So it, within the um, stockless organic um, system, um, controlling weeds, uh, well, obviously you're cutting and mulching for the fertility building. You're, you're doing that very much to maximize the fertility, but making sure you're keeping an eye on the weeds in the system. So you're topping them before they shed their seeds. The, the, the basic principles and techniques are the same as we did in the, the mixed farming. Um, we brought some potatoes into the rotation because of their high, high value. Um, and we were able to use um, thermal weed control in those. Um, hand roguing actually does become relevant in a system like this, uh, but when it does all go wrong, sometimes you have to put the mower through um, to pr prevent uh, a weed disaster uh, from building up and, and sacrificing uh, the crop. 
what I did notice in this system was that, that where you did get small numbers of weeds, such as in this picture here of, of the poppies amongst, uh, amongst the wheat, it is just how fantastic this was for insects. You could walk into these fields and they were absolutely alive uh, with insect life, which is with something that we never saw in the conventional crops at, at that time. Um, a bit of a surprise to us was that one, one field built up a serious dock infestation, so, so much so that uh, we contemplated putting that field into potatoes and using the de-stoning machine with casual labour to actually hand pick the, the dock tubers off the uh, de-stoning machine as we went through, through the field. So th this, this, was a, this was a very serious problem. Um, at least one crop I sacrificed. This was a, a crop which was completely infested with wild oats and um, we decided it was better to use the fertility than allow the seed bank to, to increase. And there were certain parts of um, organic farming which left me slightly uncomfortable, this, this being one of them. This was known as the, the green burger, uh, the green burner, which is something which um, always used to make me smile a bit. Um, it, it is, as you can see, highly um, unselective in how it works. Um, if you're a bee beetle and a spider uh, that are on the ground there, you haven't really got much hope, uh, neither have you if you're a weed. And of course, this was all being done before uh, people thought about climate change. Um, the residues of pesticides in water being deemed to be far more serious a problem than any carbon dioxide emissions coming out from a machine like this. So um, we, we carried this experiment out for, uh, for about 10 years, but, but I think early on in the experiment, it became clear to us that, that organic farming was not going to be the, the future of crop production in the UK. And that really made us turn towards this approach of integrated farm management. And I, I think this still does have, you know, is really highly relevant to, to today. It is combining the cultural, biological and mechanical control text, techniques with the due judicious use of, uh, of chemical control. Uh, and of course, around this time, the distribution trade were getting very good at um, modifying herbicide dose rates so that we didn't have to use label rates. We were able to manage uh, pest populations rather than eliminate them and save money at the same time. There, there was a lot of interest in, in threshold approaches and th that approach works very well for pest management. Uh, I think another thing that Vic Jordan taught me from the life experiment where they, they uh, tried uh, threshold approaches to weed management in, in the early years is the the old adage of one year seeding, seven years weeding still holds to this day uh, and eliminating weed seed shed is really important. Um, the other th important part of, of this approach, of course, is also uh, reduced tillage. Um, so, uh, yeah. You may have a, a weed uh, um, in the crop that's not causing economic damage within that crop, but it has the potential to cause damage in, 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 in the next crop. So back in 99, there was a survey of tillage practice in the UK, which found that 90% of farms were uh, ploughing. Um, six years later, in 2005, uh, following some work which compared the work rates of, of, of plough-based tillage with non-plough-based tillage, showing um, savings of 52 minutes per hectare in crop establishment time, we saw a massive shift over to um, this approach uh, to tillage, which, which is this one pass or min till. This is the uh, machine that I use for the night drilling. So now you can actually see it from outside the cowl. We've created a seed bed there, a stale seed bed, you can see on the left side of the field, and we're going through with, with one pass drilling. Uh, and so it was a big shift uh, to, to this approach. Uh, but one of the problems of, of, of that particular machine is disturbing the soil to that degree is great for germinating weeds as a stale seed bed, but it also germinates the weeds in the crop period uh, very well too and then you've got to, to deal with that. So we moved over to minimizing uh, soil disturbance, leaving the trash on the surface, uh, bringing in uh, light equipment like this. This is the original trash rake uh, 
raking this across the field post harvest. This is really good, not just at uh, mixing in the chopped straw, but mixing the soil with the seeds which are shed on the surface to help create a, a stale seed bed. And if we look at that close up, you can see that the stubble is still largely intact. The chopped straw has been spread and soil mixed up with it. All we need now is a shower of rain and we'll get uh, the greening up within, within that field. And at that time, we also got very interested on, in the ecological benefits of leaving weed seeds at the surface for feeding birds in the winter time. And also we got interested in how we could improve insect populations uh, within, within the crops to benefit uh, biodiversity. And, and some of the work done by the Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust at that time showed the importance of insects in, in the diet of grey partridge chicks. And, and in fact, um, by uh, sucking insects out of cereal crops for, for, for 30 years, they discovered that, that more insects in, in the crop delivered uh, more um, grey partridge chicks and that there was a very close um, correlation between the amount of broadleaf weeds within crops and the amount of insects that were there. So we were quite interested to see if we could um, manage broadleaf weed uh, populations within the crop to benefit biodiversity. Uh, and one of the things we, we, we looked at was trying to widen the rows in the crop to allow more light in the spring to reach the soil so that the spring germinating weeds would be able to survive within the crop uh, without causing a, a competition uh, issue. And um, where, where that worked, it was highly effective. So you can see red shank here growing in amongst a crop of wheat. Red, red shank is actually particularly good for grey partridges. Uh, and, and this looked like an exciting way of combining um, better ecological status within the field, but, but still maintaining the crop yields. Uh, unfortunately, the, the management of this is actually very difficult to do. Uh, even going through with an inter-row hoe using those wide rows was difficult. And, and you know, from time to time, you'd get a, a, a problem like this. I'm not sure the yield here is compromised, but, but certainly um, combining that crop is going to be very tricky, particularly um, if conditions are uh, at least slightly wet. So that moves me on to a movement which which grew out of the the, the broader approach of, of integrated farming, which was which, which was conservation agriculture. Conservation agriculture's guiding principles say minimum soil disturbance, maximum crop cover, and a diverse crop rotation. And at that time, we formed the European Conservation Agricultural Federation, um, which was made up of seven national associations. So it was a great deal of knowledge sharing about how we made. Um, um, non-plough tillage more effective and there are now 15 of those national associations. And out of that became this came this soil and water protection uh, project which compared uh, conventional plough based tillage with uh, with uh, various types of min till and using cover crops uh, within within the system. Um, in this particular trial, we were looking at the impacts of, 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 of runoff and catching the sediment from those plots. Uh, and, and what we found was that under plough based systems where you loosen the soil and, and, and create erodible particles, there was uh, considerably greater um, water runoff, sediment runoff, and as a result, the amount of phosphate which was lost from the fields and under, under plough based tillage. The, the other thing that we found, and I think this is highly relevant to today, particularly given the, the data Pete has just shown us on weather, is that the earthworm numbers and the channels in the soil on a non-inversion tillage build up massively. And this means that the soil is much able to deal with heavy rainfall of events uh, than the conventional soils are. And actually they are much better able to support crops during drought conditions because the crops use those earthworm channels to access moisture from, from deep in the soil. We also found that a small amount of, of trash on the surface helped to stop soil capping. So this is min-till sugar beet. This is the 
uh, Belgium site, which was part of the project. And this is the ploughed one where we've seen the capping taking place. So some additional benefits coming through. And also there's been a, a lot of work done on, on, on winter cover crops and how they can help to protect soil and uh, increase soil carbon and uh, uh, add, add nutrients. Um, Again, some lessons learned from this. I mean, I was always told that, that cover crops were good because they kept the, the soil active through the winter time. It meant that the, there was water being trans, tra, transpired from that soil, which meant that it was drier when it comes to, to, to till it uh, in the spring. I don't believe a word of it. Actually, dry, uh, bare soil dries out far better than it does when it's covered in a cover crop. Cover crops manage to keep the moisture in the soil. And of course, in, in foggy mornings, the, 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 the water vapor condenses on the leaf and drips onto the soil, making it, making it even, even wetter. But, but some, some cover crops can be really useful in increasing the amount of um, uh, organic matter in the soil. Um, th this is a crop that was sown in late August and the photograph was taken in late October. Uh, the, the mustard here is a metre high and just about to go into flower, but mercifully won't produce any seed to cause us a weed problem. Uh, and we've been using these uh, very effectively on fields, which it's impossible to stop soil erosion from. Th th this field here, we'd almost decided we're going to have to put into woodland because we could not stop this erosion problem. And amazingly, uh, the year that we put a, a cover crop in and it div developed very well, it's a very cheap one, it's some um, uh, some some radish with some some oats um it worked very well the other thing that we used to use that worked very well was early sown crops and of course we we can't do that anymore because of this problem of black grass which is a profound problem for all of us to deal particularly on uh, heavy soil types so um being able to put some soil cover ahead of, of drilling uh, and then delaying that drilling works very well uh, and this is us sowing some direct drilling some some uh, winter wheat into um, a, a cover crop of beans uh, when we did this people looked at us with incredulity because they, they they couldn't believe that we'd ever get this to grow but but in fact the the the, the seed was successfully sown. Uh, once the crop emerged, we used a selective herbicide to take the beans out. And to my amazement, that when we went back six weeks later, we had a really fantastically emerged crop. Uh, and, and what we learned here is that actually cover crops can uh, very, uh, very easily be used as nurse crops uh, and help your uh, crop to establish when you put them in. The other great thing about using a direct drill is you don't disturb the soil, so you don't get the weed flush that you get with the rotavator I showed earlier. That means that the, so the, the weeds don't seem to, to germinate in the soil um, quite as, uh, as much as we see um, elsewhere. And, and that's what the crop looks like uh, as we go into, into summertime. Um, then we have some other advantages that in that moisture is conserved where we don't cultivate. So this was drilled on the same day as this crop, uh, but this crop was, was cultivated and the, and the moisture was lost. And we're finding actually bringing grass lays back into the rotation is an exceptionally good way of dealing with black grass. Uh, but the last thing you want to do when you come out of the grass lay is to plough it because you bring up all the dormant seed. You want to actually direct drill and take advantage of the relatively stale surface that you've got going in, into that. But that does, of course, rely on us having glyphosate. Um, and I think we're going to hear a little bit more about that later. Um, so some really up-to-date results from the uh, Conservation Agriculture Project that we're in partnership with, with these other organisations. Um, this is a, a European project with, with sites in a number of other countries uh, within Europe. It's based around three different cultivation systems, but what makes it quite unique is that these uh, cultivation systems are taking place in the same fields each year. So each of the field is split into a third. One third is direct drilled, one third is min tilled, and one third is ploughed. And we've really been trying to measure everything that we possibly can 
Um, so there's a summary there of the results, and I'll just pick out the highlights, uh, really, which are, from, from my perspective, working for GWCT, um, more birds and more earthworms on both sites means that ecologically it's better. Um, I think uh, the work rate, if you follow along, is, um, is good news too. There's some reduction in the carbon footprint and uh, soil greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, yes, there is a slight reduction in yield, but we're overall we're seeing an increase in crop margin as we move away from um, intensive tillage to, to lighter tillage. So um, it's great to be gathering that amount of data um, in, in one session. However, you know, on some of the fields here, this field's been in Mintil for 20 years. We've now reached black grass saturation point. Um, I think a rotational plough is what's required. Uh, we have done that in that field, but I still see the, the black grass is coming through. Um, but we'll probably destroy quite a bit of that when we put the seed bed in. So that's wait and see. What I found particularly interesting is this, that charlock seeds that we planted, that, that we ploughed down 20 years ago, able to germinate once we plough back up again. And we hadn't realized the extent to which we had depleted the Charlock seed bank through minimal tillage. This is a drone shot of zero till, which is at the top of the picture, min till, which is in the middle, and the plow base bit, which is here at the bottom. The red in that picture is the bare ground. Let me tell you that the plowed area is not showing any bare ground because it is simply plastered with Charlock, which has been brought up from deep into the seed bank. Uh, and it just shows us really what we're up against when it comes to um, de dealing with this. So um, I'm keeping my eye on the clock here, Nicola. And uh, the, the, the next bit really deals more with um, integrated pest management. So I'll, I'll, I will just skip over it. Um, issues of slugs under min-till versus ploughing systems. And, and this data here, um, looking at BYDV infection, much lower levels under direct drill compared to, compared to ploughing. Uh, and we think that's down to the presence of spiders uh, being able to weave their webs in direct drilled stubbles and capture aphids coming in to in infect the crop. And we've tried this in oilseed rape to try and catch this particular problem, cabbage stem flea beetle. And um, some really interesting results coming from that. Um, this is um, insects sampled from the uh, three tillage systems that we operated uh, in advance of oilseed rape. And um, on the right there, you can see the uh, insects that we gathered in the ploughed. And the ones we're interested there are the, the, the light blue and the yellow. Those are the cabbage stem flea beetle species. Um, so you see in the plough there, in the middle of that stack, um, you've got quite a lot of cabbage stem flea beetle and the same in the min till. And when you go across the zero till, we, we didn't find any. Um, then the other species we're interested in is the orange sandwich, which is the spiders. You can see there's very few in the plough. There's more in the min till and, and quite a lot in the light till. And I got quite excited about this because uh, I, I concluded that, that if we left long stubbles in the winter wheat, in the wheat uh, before rape, then we could solve the uh, we could solve the cabbage stem flea beetle problem, but, but, but I was wrong because the, the following year we did the same thing and the, the spiders didn't turn up for work. Uh, and that, of course, is, is one of the problems of, um, of, dealing with, uh, of dealing with biological control. So um, my final couple of slides, uh, regen agriculture. Well, I think probably now this is, you know, everything thrown in together. It turned the clock right the way back to mixed organic farming and what the livestock bring to the, um, to the, to the, to, to the party, uh, to the diversity of cropping that we know integrated farm management does to the change in tillage system, um, going away from intensive carbon intensive plowing to, 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 to min till, um, minimizing the soil disturbance, incorporating living roots through 
um, through cover crops uh, and also now moving into uh, multi-species lays. We've, we've started to grow these on the farm here. I'm a massive fan. They're, they're amazing. Uh, we don't put any fertilizer on, on them, but they finish sheep faster than any of the other lays on, on the farm. They've got diversity of rooting. Um, they just seem to put real vigor back into the soil. Um, and so we, we found that if we grow this for three years, um, graze it down hard uh, or spray it and then spray it off with glyphosate and then direct drill it, sometimes using a low disturbance subsoiler. Um, the black grass which emerges is massively depleted, but it is not eliminated. It still manages to come through in year four. And those of you who are weed scientists will know that that uh, could be expected. But we found one more trick. If we direct drill hybrid barley into the first phase as we come out of the lay in the rotation, this crop is so competitive that it stops the black grass from uh, seeding in that fourth year. And then in fifth year, you can go into winter wheat and, and the, the field is pretty clean. Uh, the leading field I've got on this is now five years out from when we came out of the lay period. And only now are we starting to see the black grass emerging in, in, in any numbers at all. So um, my conclusions, um, diverse crop rotations very much assist in crop management. Weed interactions interact with the rotation and with soil cultivations, uh, but the field history is an important determination of, uh, determinant of, of weed pressure. And it's quite interesting that within the tillage trial, the, the three tillage systems in the one field, uh, in, in some fields, the black grass is worst in the plow plots, and in some fields, it's worst in the zero till plots. So it, it's the field history which is determining the issue rather than the, the tillage systems. Um, any lay period is going to be useful for our whole range of, of, of reasons, particularly in depleting short-lived arable weeds. Uh, and using multiple control strategies enables a progressive approach to, to weed management. Um, uh, Short-term changes in cultivation strategies can help to uh, assist containment. Um, uh, I, and I'm hoping that uh, whilst I'm going to have to battle with 20-year-old charlock seeds coming up and germinating in abundance, uh, burying 20 years of surface blackgrass seed uh, out of the germination zone, I hope is um, going to be helpful. Uh, that's me done. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Alistair. That was a, a really good sort of like history lesson in the new evolution of integrated weed management there. I see we've got some questions coming through, so we'll have those for the, um, the discussion session in a, in a little while before lunch. Uh, next up, we've got Gary Willoughby, who's going to give us a sort of like a farmer's point of view of, of, of integrated weed management. So Gary is a basis qualified AHDB monitor uh, farmer from Lincolnshire. And he's going to, as I said, give us his grower's perspective on what steps he takes before he reaches for the pesticide cam. OK, thank you, Gary. Over to you. I can see your, your slides have come through, so that's great. And if people can keep the questions coming in to the Q&A. Thank you. Super. Thank you very much, Nicola. And um, welcome, everybody. Um, love that, uh, Alistair. Thank you very much. That was a um, yeah, great little half hour there. Really love that. Some great <laughs> slides. Um, yeah, did enjoy your sort of talk through the farming buzz lines. Um, yeah, sort of whether I'm regen ag or what, I'm not really sure. But um, yeah, or whether biological agriculture is coming forward as well. So um, and some good info on the BYDV on that one. So um, that's good. Thank you. So my name's Gary Willoughby. Um, for the course of the next sort of half an hour, I'm pretty much generic farmer. Um, what I'm doing is not particularly special, but I'm going to give you a bit of a run through anyway. So basis qualified, um, been back on the farm for what, seven, eight years now. And I kind of felt that if I was going to be a farmer, then it'd be a good thing to do going through the basis program. So small time farm contractor, do bits and pieces on other farms um, locally to me, which is a good way of seeing what's going on, talking to the neighbours, um, sharing ideas. It's great. Also, AHDB Waynefleet monitor farmer. So welcoming um, farmer groups onto the farm. Um, sharing ideas between farmers 
um, trying to keep it as much farmer to farmer as possible without getting too much, um, yeah, without too much of a commercial world coming into it, um, trying that anyway. Um, new to the direct drilling, uh, whole farm is now two years in, a few bits and pieces, three years, and hopefully soon to be carbon trader. So, yeah, there we go, that's it, back up. So, we are at uh, Primrose Farm, this Gegness on the east coast of Lincolnshire, and we're on the marsh at the sea level. So, if we go to the northwest of here, we get into the chalky wolds, a um, bit easier draining. If you go further south towards Boston, you're on the, um, the nice silts over there into the veg cropping land. Um, and we sort of get the, the puddly bit on the coast. Um, so quite a quite some sort of challenging soil type in the silty clay. And I just put up a little there, uh, some soil testing that we had done. So some pretty reasonable sort of clay contents um, in there, some sort of good magnesium as well, which is a bit of a challenge. Um, but um, but also we get we get some good worm counts as well. And, and that, that's improving all the time with the, the sort of move away from the plough based system. So we're a low rainfall area, um, just a few bits and pieces I'm gonna run through about the farm um, just to sort of get you up to speed really. So low rainfall area, although we do still get some uh, sort of pretty extreme weather as, as is happening all over the country now. Uh, a couple of years ago, we were, sort of flooded out when the uh, river steeping flooded burst its banks. So that was just a mile away, the river breach. So that caused us plenty of headaches. Um, although it's amazing how well land bounced back from being sort of covered in water, dead worms floating on the surface. It's, it's, it's amazing to see how the, uh, the land recovered. It was great really. Um, so we're 180 acres, 100 and FBT, do a bit of stubble to stubble contracting, a bit of spraying for a local neighbor. Um, harvest a bit more than our own as well, which is all good income. Um, some drilling and that's moved from conventional drilling into more of a direct drilling. Uh, we're all combinable cropping. So um, yeah, it was interesting listening to Alistair um, about his uh, all arable without the livestock um, and the organic possibilities. I think that's the holy grail really. Um, so wheat, barley, oilseed rape, although not this year, uh, beans and linseed. Store is removed, uh, cattle FYM return to the farm. So there's no livestock on farm, but we do get the advantage of having manure brought back onto the farm. That works for us really well at the moment. We were plough based up till two, three years ago. We are now direct drilling and yeah, not sure how to label myself. If I need a label, am I conservation ag, regen ag, um, biological farming? Um, just for us, it's about what's right for us at the present and going with a bit of gut feel. I think a lot of farming is about uh, going with a gut feel. Um, yeah, for me, it certainly is. So, What's my relevance to today's discussion um, on farm cultural control of weeds? And here I put integrated farm management, um, whether we're integrated pest management. Um, I went with integrated farm management. I'm sort of trying to talk through the, the whole farm approach of, of what we're doing here. Um, and now it all comes together um, as much as I can do um, before reaching for that kind of herbicide. So rotation, no, no fixed rotation, really try and mix it up as best I can. Uh, cereals, brassicas, uh, the legumes, the linseed, really just mix it up as much as possible. Don't um, long have gone are the days of the continuous wheat program or the wheat rate, wheat rate program. Um, just really trying to mix it all up. Um, as best I can. Don't let any one weed get a chance to, to get a foothold, really. Um, just really keep mixing it up. So, yeah, so we've got cereals, brassicas, 
legumes. Uh, the linseed is a new one for us, um, but that, that's that's we've had a good deal with the linseed this last year, so hopefully that will continue. Um, and yeah, each crop using different active ingredients, modes of actions, and partnered together in in different cocktails as well. Um, so I'm not first to reach for the can, um, trying to do as much of these other things as possible. But when we do need to go through and spray, then again, variety, mix it up and keep on, keep on top of these weeds. As well as that early drilling, if we can get lins, um, oil seed rape in early, uh, drill our winter wheat later, um, spring drill crops. So the, the beans in the spring, the linseed in the spring, leave that as late as possible, get the ground warmed up. It allows us to go through with the glyphosate, um, get a really sort of, get as much sort of weeds out of the crop before we put the seed in the ground is what I'm trying to do. And if that seed goes in the ground, um, things are warm, it's going to fly out the ground, soon cover the ground um, so that we're, we're not sort of getting light down and encouraging weed seeds to grow so really doing um, it is difficult with the weather the last couple of autumns have been a bit of a nightmare but um, yeah things have gone much better this autumn it's been very kind so you're trying to trying to mix it up as much as we can there uh, cover crops as gain as diverse as I can make it as well trying to keep the cost down on that um, having linseed in the rotation they can go cereal, wheat, I'll put barley in there. Um, I haven't put the beans in because they're, they're such a sort of big seed, but um, veggies grow well. Clovers are a bit more tricky, but uh, get them established and they're great. And also the time and the disc drill on farm, both direct drills, but having both is a real asset um, as well. Um, and Bo both have their place, as we're going to sort of talk about um, on the next picture or two. So, yeah, so here they are. So, drilling, we're on some pretty stiff ground, uh, so it's expensive to move it, whether that be ploughing or using the cultivator, like in the sort of left of the picture there. A lot of diesel used, obviously, that's getting expensive, moving away from that. And so here we have uh, both of my direct drilling options. So if we look at the weaving drill, the, the discs on here work through the soil at an angle. Uh, we've, we've seen the John Deere 750A drill um, with Alistair's slides. Um, this one doing a similar job, just cutting it at a slight angle. And it really is amazing how we can pop a seed in, get it covered up and really move the most minute amount of soil. And, and quite often we find that we're not moving enough soil. We're not fracturing that soil to allow that wheat seed from sort of 40, 50 mil down to come back out again. We've had problems where we've um, had sheep grazing an overwinter cover crop um, on some sort of stubble turnips and that sort of thing go through the disc drill, put the seed in, and we just don't see it again because the, the sheep have just um, trod down that top layer of soil, not made a mess, and it's still lovely underneath. You get two inches down where the seed is, it's beautiful. Um, but just on the top there, it's just not fracturing the soil. So we're, we're finding that, that that's a, definitely an unforeseen problem. It really is for us. And... The, then having the tine drill, much more forgiving in our rotation. Having the tine can be used later in the autumn when things get a bit more challenging, getting a bit more, getting a bit wetter. It also, we did do half of our um, sheep grazed stubble turnips with a tine, just as a bit of a comparison. And having these little chisel points, uh, just 12 mil wide, uh, which is plenty wide enough to get a seed in behind it. Um, chisel through that sort of compacted, if you like, just top layer, chisel through it, pop the seed in, and we had great establishment behind there. Um, and while we've got the picture of the drill here, I'd like to just 
share my little ideas of the time spacing on here is eight inches or sort of 200 to 202 mil on here and when we're talking about soil disturbance not moving the soil is really key for me um and this is this is a little drill that i made up at home here stuck a generic hopper on the top to pop the seed in and but yeah looking at making one with sort of a 10 inch time spacing between here so that again we're moving a lot less soil um it, it's amazing how much of a percentage of soil less we move just spacing the tines out um that really is hopefully working well i think we're going to go to 10 inch on the next one um and then whether whether that does lead us down the inter row hoeing route uh quite possibly uh, in time we'll, we'll see how we go on with sort of herbicide pressure um, if we sort of lose many more actives we uh yeah we do we may struggle a little bit uh, but that, that that's my drilling gear it's it's working well having both is is great um and i did sell a plow to sort of help purchase one of these drills and um yeah it, it, it's worked well so um there's, there's no reason i don't think why anybody sort of can't have a go without spending too much money it's um it's great i'm loving it so talking about weeds and weed pressure on farm and before we even get the crop established um for me out here on the marsh uh obviously black grass i'm sure i don't need to tell you that but that's going to be uh, it is a massive problem for us. Uh, we've got sort of really tiring drainage system uh, that was sort of put in in late 70s. And getting this right, getting the drainage right is imperative um, and it's not cheap. It's, uh, it's quite expensive. Uh, so this is this is some drainage work that I did back in uh, April, May time. So here we've we've got a we've got a crop of spring wheat in the left left picture just gone in the ground we can just about see it starting to green up going straight across the field with the uh, trencher this is on the back of my tractor so a machine I'd hired get in there I've gone through several sort of low wet holes this is sort of good and high clay content soil plenty of black grass improve the drainage I've got the stone going in. I will be moulding after and if the ground doesn't sit so wet the black grass is not going to be such a problem it's just getting these little basics right that is really going to help us on farm again combating the black grass but also making the direct drilling work for us we've got to get the drainage right and uh, i've got up here the subsoiling and ploughing i think the more I sort of go down the direct drilling route, I'm sure that the subsoiling and ploughing is a great way of just getting that water down away from the surface. So you don't end up with the puddles on top of the, the land, but it's, it's wet underneath. Um, it, it's great for sort of masking the problem. And this is the expensive solution, which is quite often, I'm sure, why it's shied away from. But um, this is this is setting me up for my lifetime, hopefully setting up my boys for a good future as well. So, um, yeah, drainage is key. Shouldn't be uh, underestimated how, how good this is. Um, even I know we're talking about sort of weeds, but this is all part of the solution. So uh, we've got rotation, drainage, the minimal soil disturbance, cover cropping, uh, which we're still getting the hang of uh, here. I am trying, I'm trying to keep it cheap, um, but that's great. I've grown some big cover crops in the last couple of years and it is amazing what it does for the soil, all those roots going through. Um, the, the amount of worms that just seem to come out of nowhere uh, is pretty phenomenal. Uh, I'm seeing more beetles, uh, more spiders, all sorts going on the soil. I don't know what they all are, but there's creeper crawlies all over and it can only be a good thing. So all in the name of, of soil health, but what does soil health actually mean? I'm not really sure. It's, a, it's another buzzword at the moment, but for me, it is all just about so the, the good farming practice 
uh, not making it complicated, keeping it, just keeping it simple um, and doing what's right for us on the, us, us on the farm. And, um, and yeah, sort of keeping it, keeping it as simple as possible, really. Um, yeah. So what more could I be doing on farm future direction? Um, we've already mentioned the sort of diverse cropping. Well, it could get even more diverse yet. Yeah. Uh, we've already heard today about the sort of the, the grass lays, including sort of clovers um, and all sorts and really sort of mixing the crop in there. That, that, that's pretty exciting. Um, miscanthus is something we sort of look at, but do we really want to put whole fields down for sort of 10, 15 years on the miscanthus? Uh, not really sure that we're going to come from a income uh, side that it, it may be worthwhile in the future, but um, but not overly convinced yet how that's going to work out. And then with the development of the elms, um, are we going to be putting whole fields down to sort of pollen, nectar and bird mixes? Quite possibly. I think that's certainly going to become uh, more commonplace. We are in the countryside stewardship scheme already. It's, uh, it's not been the easiest to get along with, but I can certainly see that being uh, sort of more coming into the, the farming rotation more. And I think that will be a great tool, to be fair, uh, without having the livestock on farm. Um, putting in a pollen and nectar mix instead of having a grass and clover mix for sheep raising, put that it put that in there, um, trim it off at the correct times, um, and that that'll be a, a really useful tool. Also, companion cropping. We have grown oilseed rape with a clover, buckwheat, and fenugreek uh, companion. Uh, it's great to see all those extra species coming through. Some taken out with herbicide, some taken out by just just frosty weather over winter kill. Um, so that that was great. Um, something we need to do more of. Um, and yeah, the herbicide options here um, it gets um, it gets a bit tricky. What can be used? What can be used that is going to take out some of those companions? Um, yeah, something I, I need to sort of learn more out, um, find out as much information as I can on that. That front the living mulch idea clover understories uh something i definitely want to try and farm we've, we've got a good bit of winter wheat in the ground this year um come the spring when it's when it's suitable to travel possibly go through with the herbicide um sort of take out the red shank fat hen uh, the, the usual suspects that we get and establish a clover understory um again that is very uh there's so many different species of clover out there, um, but um, yeah, get the right one and it, and it looks fantastic. Um, so I'm thinking that, that that is going to be a good way for us to go and keep that black grass. Um, we've got pigeon prices going through the roof, so building up soil fertility is going to be is going to be great if it can it'll hopefully save us a few quid along the way. Rotational ploughing, obviously discussed that we're we're direct drilling now. Um, but rotational ploughing, um, will that come back into it? It, it sounds from, from Alistair that um, is it better the devil you know with what you've got? Um, I foresee a building black grass problem. So are we going to sort of try and plough that black grass seed bank down or are we going to bring a, something else up that, um, that that is equally as bad? Um, and it doesn't particularly fit with the sort of the, the carbon capture route that we're going down and selling our carbon credits the sort of uh, full inversion tillage really doesn't sort of sit so well with that um, it could well be an option but it uh, it could well be a problem as well and for me really interesting the future of the sort of soil biology um, we're already seeing uh, a massive lift in worm numbers in our soil, um, wormholes through the soil, um, little tiny worms, maybe only sort of five or 10 mil long, but they're there. We need to keep them growing. Um, this, 
the best way I've got of knowing that what I'm doing on farm is working for us. Um, obviously, top of the food chain. That that's yeah, that's my best indicator that I've got at the moment. So just keep helping build soil structure and function, and hopefully that the, the better my soil uh, works. Hopefully we're not so wet. The ground isn't so wet, so more difficult for these weeds to sort of to, to get going. And again, pesticide stewardship. Um, I've talked about mixing mixing up my herbicide choices. Um, we really need to keep as many options as we can. Um, really, is a bit of a concern the the rate that we lose active ingredients. Um, so we really need to sort of as farmers. Um, stewards of the land we really need to look after as many of these products as we can before before the options are taken away for, from us and we're backed in a corner really really can see that being a problem so all the things that i've mentioned here is what can i do before reaching for a can of pesticide that's what the sort of integrated farm management means the pesticide is a great tool i think if you can get to organic no-till that really is the holy grail but um, very tricky to do. Um, I think if you can if you can make that work, then hat off to you. That is that is absolutely fantastic. Um, but for me, we'll try and keep reducing our pesticide use, as many biological controls as we can, integrated farm management, integrated pest management, all these things before we need to sort of reach the can um, and worry about sort of possible resistance as well. And oh, there's my last picture, bit of a holding slide. So just a little picture of year two direct drilled wheat into a uh, spring bean. Yeah, these were spring beans, uh, stubble, and quite uh, quite pleased with that one. It's nice when it works, it's direct drilling. It um, causes me yeah, moments to tear my hair out, but, um, but it's great. The thought of going back to sort of plowing everything over every year would uh, really fill, fill me with dread now. So um, yeah, any um, yeah anything to get keep away from that is is great. Making it work is is really interesting. Uh, the less time I spend sitting on a tractor, uh, sort of ploughing, cultivating, um, is, is great. More time with the kids. That's what I like to to think of. So um, so please, any questions? Um, please keep them coming. Um, yeah, be be great to hear from you. Uh, and I'll answer. As, as best I can, but uh, just a brief roundup of, of what we're trying to do on farm, what's actually happening right now. So um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gary. That was really interesting to hear how you're implementing integrated farming methods on your farm, sort of actually in practice and on mm. your plans for the future. As Gary said, if you could keep questions coming into the, the uh, Q&A panel and um, we'll answer those in the panel discussion uh, just before lunch. Uh, so next up, we have got a, a double act um, on um, barriers and enablers to IPM adoption. So we've got um, Dr. Henry Chryson, who is an applied plant pathologist and integrated pest management expert at SRUC. Um, so his sort of interests are um, in developing sustainable disease management strategies for arable crops, but he also uh, collaborates with social scientists to uh, quantify uh, the adoption of IPM practices and develop approaches to increase their uptake. And also presenting, uh, speaking along with Henry is Holly Clarkson, who is a social science consultant working with the policy and economics team at ADAS. And so within this team, Holly specializes in social science research methodologies, stakeholder engagement and qualitative analysis, which contributes to a range of agricultural and environmental consultancy projects for public and private sector. Um, that's great, I can see your, um, your slides are up on the screen. Uh, as before, if uh, the audience can keep the questions coming into the, the Q&A panel, that would be great. Thank you. So over to you, Henry and Holly. Brilliant. Thanks. Nick, uh, can you hear and see me? Yes, we can. Brilliant. OK, so today, um, Holly and I are going to talk about uh, the barriers and enablers to IPM adoption. I'll begin by presenting some of the findings from the recently revised uh, voluntary initiative IPM assessment plans, and then we'll move on to discussing the environmental land management scheme IPM test and trial project. So integrated pest management is really a, a process we, uh, that we 
try to encourage people to adopt um that's recently defined by the ahdb this prevent detect control um something else that needs to be added in is an assess or an evaluation period and this is very much an iterative process that can occur many times even within the same season to facilitate that process we've developed a tool which is uh, really to facilitate discussion between the main decision makers which most of the time is the farmer and the agronomist and this sort of, uh, through going through this process of working out what you're doing why you're doing it and hopefully that sort of uh, and the associated guidance can be used to develop ipm action plans and these action plans uh, often need to be very specific sometimes to the farmer the farm uh, sometimes the fields the crop and even the specific pest uh, as well as being a useful tool to facilitate that discussion, it offers us a, a great opportunity to gather some data on what's being done now and why it's being done. Through the work that we've done in collaboration with uh, University of Reading, Chagas and Athby in Northern Ireland, uh, we've developed a, a scoring system for IPM based on expert opinion, which I'll discuss more later. These um, plans also allow us to identify any topics or issues um, so that we can best direct research and development and knowledge uh, transfer and exchange activities to try to um, best serve the farmer. This is the scoring systems. So these are a few questions pulled out from the, the survey, which is only about 20 to 24 questions, depending on which one you're doing. And it takes about half an hour to complete. And um, the scoring system was uh, um, based on the opinion of IPM decision makers largely, so agronomists and farmers, but there were others also involved um, and around about 50 folks have contributed towards this. As you'll see, um, about half of the scores are um, awarded to measures to prevent the introduction and spread of pests on farm, but there are also a lot of points awarded to and um, the reasons for adopting a rotation, of what rotations have been practiced, choice of variety and um, whether um, you're considering lots of uh, factors as part of your IPM plan. So IPM is a holistic approach to pest management, which aims to maximize profits and productivity whilst minimizing negative impacts on the environment. So the more things considered, generally speaking, uh, the better your IPM strategy will be. We've uh, developed two IPM plans. Um, one is uh, the broadacre crop one, which is arable focused. And we also recently developed a grass and one. Both of these were launched um, December, January of last of this year, so last winter. As of last week, we've collected over three and a half thousand plans, the majority of those being arable. So that does indicate that actually we do need to be focusing our efforts in engaging with those grass and farmers a bit more. The means were roughly um, the same, but um, it must be said that these are not directly comparable because the metrics are, are different as because the surveys are different the grass and one focuses on integrated weed management but what you will notice that we've got a nice normal distribution we've captured the full range um, in terms of uh, what we consider to be ipm adoption on uk farms we didn't see much of a difference in terms of average scores um, between the, the countries um, included uh, which is predominantly england so of those three and a half thousand about two and a half thousand were from england but we can look at um, what practices are being adopted and hopefully be more regionally nationally locally specific in terms of our research and development in those areas what you'll notice um, when looking at the purple bars is that the plow regular plowing um, has been still widely adopted in scotland as it is um, in northern ireland as well um, this uh, is on the flip side of that, we can see that England and Wales are heavily adopting reduced tillage techniques um, or no-till in particular. When looking at the pests of uh, most concern, no surprises, we've heard from earlier that England and Wales, black grass is one of the top uh, pests of their, their concern, perhaps linked to the, um, the adoption of uh, reduced tillage techniques. Partly because of that, um, the adoption of stale seedbed is much higher in those countries. Um, but also, it must be noted that in Northern Ireland, particularly as you move up 
to the northern parts of Scotland. And um, such techniques are not really available. They're not practically available to the grower because uh, that window between um, harvesting a crop and sowing the next crop is much smaller as you go further north. The lack of, uh, well, less adoption of um, reduced tillage techniques is perhaps not surprising as you move into Scotland as well. Um, as we mentioned earlier, that's very much a sort of system change that requires more diverse rotations and some of the crops which will grow quite happily in say the south and east of England uh, will not in, uh, as you move up to the sort of north of Scotland, so there's less crops available really to them. Um, England um, and Wales are adopting sort of this mint-till stale seed bed sort of techniques, whereas in Scotland and, Ireland, and Northern Ireland are much more focused on plough which, um, and um, not having so many problems with black grass. Uh, it also allows them to do more precise sort of spot spraying and roguing of, of, to deal with specific weed issues. We can look at the differences between the high and low adopters and find out what those high adopters are doing that perhaps the others aren't and whether there's any sort of easy wins that we can sort of uh, introduce there or encourage. Um, if you look to the right hand part of the chart, you'll see that preventative measures um, are much more widely adopted uh, for those top 25% of farmers as, as assessed by IPM score. They're using much more um, of these preventative measures and, and that fits with sort of the IPM ethos. They're also considering many more factors when planning for IPM. So they're looking at previous pest disease levels and uh, in the field, weed maps, yield maps, keeping on top of um, technical advances and, and in terms of things like product efficacy, doing cost benefit analysis. So again, considering more factors, the, the whole system when planning for IPM tends to lead to a higher level of adoption. Those top uh, growers are also more likely to be involved in discussion groups. Um, and they're typically speaking, they're much more likely to actively engage with IPM techniques so, and with those experts that have that knowledge. So there's much more of an emphasis on knowledge exchange rather than knowledge transfer. So this active two-way flow of information is certainly preferred by those top adopters, which gives us some indication as to what sort of advice and guidance perhaps we need to be delivering down the line. And they're also more likely to use uh, an agronomist and rely on them. And that's something um, that we see throughout as well. As I said, we can provide sort of higher level guidance, sort of some trials, things like that, but actually to translate into actionable um, advice that can result in change in practice, you do need sort of a, a middleman most of the time. And, and that is uh, most of the time the agronomist. So just to summarize quickly this section, and those higher adopters adopt more preventative measures. They're considering many more factors when planning for IPM. Um, and they're the ones that are actively seeking IPM knowledge. They're turning up to crop walks, open days, having a good relationship with their agronomists and deciding on the strategy together. But for the, that um, to be sort of put into practice, uh, we need to make sure that the IPM advice is clear, consistent, evidence-based, and ideally from an impartial source as well. And this is when, again, I'll say again, the role of the agronomist is clear here, that we need to actually be engaging, not just with the farmers, but with the agronomists there, because those are the ones, about um, roughly half of the, the sample said that they relied solely on their agronomists for their crop protection and decision-making. So they've deferred all responsibility to the agronomist, whereas a majority of the rest of them decide on, the, uh, on their IPM strategy together. And um, we'll talk a bit more about that, this later, but there sometimes can be a bit too much sort of put on the farmer in terms of IPM adoption, but IPM adoption is a responsibility of all. And uh, there can be various barriers uh, to IPM adoption. They can be technological, behavioral, which Holly will talk about shortly, um, but there's markets and the, the, there can be a lot of supply chain issues and, and uh, pinch points in the supply chain that is dictating uh, IPM decisions and taking them out of farmers' hands, which is uh, potentially restricting their further adoption. We're continually developing these uh, IPM plans. We're, we're looking at ways now to develop the broad acre crop one and the grass and one, providing feedback links to up-to-date technical advice. And we're also in the process of developing a specialised horticulture one soon. Now on to the, the test and trials. So 
Um, the environmental management scheme tests and trials projects uh, cover these six priority areas. And DEFRA is really taking a, um, a, a collaborative code design approach to these to ensure that we get the most um, public goods for the public money that's invested. Through the NFU, um, a team uh, with ADAS and SIUC were awarded a, a grant to look at this over the last year, which we just finished the final report last week. It started by um, identifying participants. So we use the VIIPM assessment plans to identify, um, to see who would opt in and identify participants that would progress through this, um, this test and trial project. They were separated out into one of three different guidance and advice groups, ranging from one to one, um, which would have been in person, but because of COVID restrictions, was most done by the phone. Um, facilitated group workshops or basic support, which we, we would return them the, the self-completers. They weren't given much um, when creating their environmental land management plans with regards to IPM. The next stage was to look at um, whether attitudes or behaviours are likely to change as a result of this process and that's where and um, that's where Holly will be sort of bringing you up to speed in a moment and then finally there's that report to Adefra which was submitted last week. When identifying participants um, we were pleased to see that actually when we looked at the spread in terms of IPM adoption from those uh, willing to take part in the test and trial uh, compared to the, the means and the, the spread uh, for those three and a half thousand um, IPM plans collected this, this year. Um, we were looking at the same sorts of things. So we feel confident the sample we selected for the test and trial is uh, representative of the national population. The next stage was to, to develop an IPM tool. Um, and we did this uh, by picking a representative crop for each sector. sector. So in horticulture, it was potatoes and grass and grass, and, and for the arable sector, it was wheat, winter wheat specifically. An Excel tool was developed. Um, it starts by gathering information on the farm background and, and just general uh, sort of um, approaches to IPM, such as uh, crop walking, recording, evaluation, um, and then um, for the specific crops, there'll, there'll be tabs for weed, uh, invertebrate pests and disease issues. And this is the one for weeds. So um, you can see the types of weeds at the top, that um, the types of control measure um, running down the side and response will give an indication as to what um, might be useful. And this is based on a review of the evidence for IPM um, conducted um, by ADAS in 2013. They were then allowed to um, select whether they were currently using, not using, or plan to introduce uh, the measure in the short or long term. And there's various links to guidance and also um, you can click on these buttons if you see uh, on the individual measures uh, to find out a bit more information about what's effective and how it can be used. And with that, I'll pass you over to Holly, who's going to take you through um, the assessment period for the Behavioural in Insights interviews. Thanks, Henry. Yeah, hello, everybody. I'm Holly. Um, and my role within the ELM Test and Trial project was to coordinate these Behavioural Insights interviews um, and to analyse them qualitatively. Um, so they were conducted as the next stage of this ELM Test and Trial, and they had three main aims. Um, the first aim was to understand the key drivers behind the uptake of IPM advice and or guidance. The second aim was to understand the impact of participation in this ELM testing trial on the uptake of advice and or guidance by farmers and land managers. And thirdly, to understand the key enablers, encouragements and barriers to the uptake of IPM advice and or guidance. So the interview guide used was designed by ADAS with collaboration from the wider project team members. Um, the NFU and DEFRA and comprised four key sections to address these aims. So firstly was you and your farm which gathered basic information about the farm such as roles and responsibilities and then advice and guidance gathered views on what interviewees actually consider to be good advice, where they get their advice and guidance on IPM from, uh, the view they have on advice and guidance they received as part of the project for example. And then went on to uptake of IPM, which aimed to understand 
where the interviewees have actually taken up the IPM guidance they received and what changes have been implemented if this is the case. Um, we also aim to understand whether the guidance received as part of the project had increased on-farm capacity to implement IPM. And then finally, enablers and barriers to IPM uptake facilitated a discussion around the enablers, encouragements and barriers to the uptake of IPM advice and or guidance and how interviewees felt these barriers could be overcome, for example. Next slide, please, Henry. Um, so farmers who had participated in earlier aspects of this project, as Henry highlighted, the land management plans, um, they were asked while they were completing the land management plan if they consented to be contacted further to take part in other aspects of the project. Um, 85 people consented to be contacted and 46 participated in an interview with us. Interviews were in depth and lasted up to an hour and a half, um, and they were undertaken by social scientists and agricultural consultants within the ADAS team. The interviews are then transcribed and analysed qualitatively, so we conducted thematic coding, whereby each interview question constituted a theme, um, and responses were coded according to the information provided by interviewees for each interview question. And this facilitated the emergence of overarching key codes for each question. Um, which we have presented at the higher level in this presentation. So additionally, we aim to assess differences in behaviours and attitudes to IPM between the three levels of guidance received during the completion of the IPM LMP. So this is what Henry um, just mentioned about the LMP was either completed as part of a workshop, um, as part of a one-to-one -one with an advisor, or with basic support or self-completer where there was little guidance. So we obtained a fairly even spread, you um, can see in the pie chart on the right hand side of interviewees across the three groups, although there was a slight skew towards workshops and away from one to ones. Um, but we performed cross tabulations between these three groups in order to assess differences in behaviours and attitudes. Um, however, just to note that these should be interpreted with slight caution as there is a slightly unequal representation of the three groups and a slightly small sample size. The next slide, please, Henry. So moving on to the results then of the three main aims of the Behavioural Insights interviews. So this slide presents results of the key drivers affecting uptake of IPM advice and or guidance. So you can see that among all interviewees, economic and environmental drivers were most referenced. So to give you an idea of what sort of things were mentioned, within economic drivers, cost savings or profitability as a result of implementing IPM practices was most referenced, followed by a supply chain of farm assurance requirements or benefits to crop production. And then within environmental drivers, specifically environmental protection enhancement or benefit um, was referenced along with biodiversity conservation and becoming more sustainable. And then in the table on the right, um, you can see the results of a cross tabulation of interview responses to drivers affecting uptake, which are down the left-hand side, um, by ELM, T and T group across the top. Um, so this is yeah whether they were completed as part of a workshop one to one or with an with an advisor or self completed, and the results show that similarities between the three groups existed for the most referenced drivers of economic and environmental. So generally, there was consensus that the economic and environmental drivers were the most significant in this case. Um, but there are differences between the groups for legislation and reducing chemical inputs as drivers, but these differences may not be significant as there is a small number of total references across all groups for these drivers, so a small sample size. Next slide, please. So moving on to the second aim, the impact of participation in the test and trial on uptake of IPM advice and guidance. So firstly, the table on the left presents results of a cross tabulation of interviewees' views on IPM before and after um, participation in the test and trial, again by ELM, t, t group, as you can see across the top. Um, interestingly, the majority of interviewees stated that they felt they already had a good understanding of IPM before the project and largely their views have not been changed. Um, but we can see that fewer one-to-one -one group members felt they had a good understanding compared to the other groups, which is an interesting finding. And then correspondingly, 15% of interviewees expressed that their view on IPM had been changed. And these interviewees came from the one-to-one -one and workshop groups, and no interviewees from the self-completed group expressed that they had a change in view. 
So one potential um, interpretation of this result could be that with the one-to-one -one and workshop groups, there was that sort of person-to-person -person discussion around IPM. Um, whereas the self-completers wouldn't have had the same level of reflection, perhaps, on the definition of IPM and whether they had a good understanding. But that's just one interpretation of the results and could be explored further. And then secondly, the table on the right presents cross-tabulation of how useful interviewees found the LMP process to complete, again, by the group that they were in uh, to complete the land management plan. So 44% of interviewees did find the land management plan useful and a further 4% highlighted it was a good tool for sense checking on farm decision making. 13% expressed they felt there was nothing new to be gained from the land management plan in terms of IPM. Um, however, 11% felt that they were just recording what they were already doing, which while may seem negatively toned from an environmental land management scheme perspective, this does show that the tool was a good way for farmers to record the IPM practices they're already implementing on the farm and could potentially be used um, in a future policy scenario to record these practices. Next slide, please, Henry. So this slide highlights um, the key barriers referenced by interviewees that would restrict uptake of IPM advice and or guidance and therefore IPM practices. So the bar chart on the left shows the most referenced barriers across all interviewees, uh, which were economic, lack of understanding or knowledge of IPM and mindset or habits. So within economic, financial risk was most referenced, followed by the costs of implementing IPM, such as buying equipment um, and the lack of on-farm resources. Uh, with lack of understanding or knowledge of IPM, this overarching code was the dominant uh, code across um, the board, there wasn't any sort of specific codes under that one. And then within mindset or habits, farmers continuing to do as they always have, um, and also perhaps generational familiarities with practices and reduced willingness to change. So a few farmers expressed the idea that younger farmers might be more willing to change, for example. So the table on the right presents cross tabulations of these barriers by ELN test and trial group. So similarities generally exist between the three groups, um, with only slightly fewer workshop interviewees finding lack of knowledge to be a barrier, and workshop group members perceived mindset to present a larger barrier. Next slide, please, Henry. Then finally, this slide presents uh, what interviewees perceive would be the biggest encouragement for farmers to implement more IPM practices. So as highlighted in the bar chart on the left, the most referenced encouragement was again economic, uh, followed by a good advertisement of IPM and its success, and also education. So within economic, most reference was a financial incentive to implement IPM, followed by increased on-farm profitability as a result of IPM. So both economic incentives from different sources, either by payment or as a result of profitability. And then within good advertisement of IPM, most referenced was IPM supported by evidence of its success, and independent published research of successful IPM practices. Um, and then within education, training and opportunities for knowledge transfer with other farmers um, and farming groups was most referenced by interviewees. And then finally, the table on the left, on the right, sorry, presents a cross tabulation of these encouragements by the ELM TNT group. And interestingly, fewer self completers felt that economic encouragements would increase uptake. Um, and workshop completers felt more strongly that education would encourage the uptake of IPM. The next slide, please, Henry. So to summarise these results um, and the behavioural insights work that we did on the ELM test and trial, for the majority of interview questions, there were similarities in behaviours and opinions surrounding IPM within the three ELM test and trial groups of self-completer, one-to-one -one and workshop. In terms of the IPM land management tool, um, approximately half of interviewees felt that the tool was useful to their farm and farming business. However, there was that additional 4% that found it a good sense checking, sense checking of decision making, um, and also those that expressed it was a good way of recording what they're already doing. And then for drivers of uptake of IPM advice and or guidance, economic and environmental drivers were the most referenced across all interviewees. Um, in terms of view on IPM before and after the test and trial, 65% of interviewees felt that they already had a good understanding of IPM before taking part in the project. But as I mentioned, a number of interviews from workshop and one-to-one -one groups stated that their views had been changed, um, which could indicate that 
as a result of taking part in person-to-person um, -person discussion, they've reflected on their view of IPM, which is just one interpretation of those results. And then key barriers to the uptake of IPM practices were highlighted as economic, lack of knowledge or understanding of IPM and mindset or habits. And then correspondingly, interviewees referenced economic factors as being the biggest encouragement to implement IPM practices on the farm, followed by, by good advertisement and education, which do match closely tackling the barriers highlighted by the interviews. So that's the uh, summary of the behavioural insights aspect of the ELM TNT. So I could pass back over to Henry to round up the presentation. Thanks, Holly. So possible next steps here. We think we've got a decent tool that allows the recording of the current levels of implementation, implementation and commitment to change. Um, this commitment to increase IPM has differed between the different sectors, um, 12 to 38% for arable crops and 2 to 21 for grassland. Um, it, there wasn't a great deal of difference between uh, the different guidance groups in terms of willingness to commit to increase IPM adoption. The next steps uh, we feel are to test uh, these recently revised and new IPM and land management tools for key crops and pests and I think that would be the best way to direct monies to best um, provide public goods surrounding IPM. For this to happen, we need to have a, a new review. Um, I said that the previous plans were placed on a 2013 review. Now um, there's a, currently reviews are going on to sort of update that um, and find out what uh, are the most effective IPM measures, how reliable they are, how economically feasible they are, and all these sorts of things. And so that's work that is ongoing or will be shortly. In terms of guidance and support, we feel the best strategy going forward would be to have a combination of, of different um, approaches, short written guidance, um, online video presentations instead of workshops that were live because uh, it was quite laborious to, to set up and also for various reasons people would drop out on the day if they weren't able to meet the meeting or for whatever reason but having that recorded so they can dip in and out whenever they wanted is probably the best strategy going forward. And we also recognise that we need a sort of technical helpline to resolve any IT issues around using um, the IPM land management plan. In terms of uh, next steps, we need to think about how we can identify um, how, ways in which these land management plans could work in conjunction with SFI standards, what economic incentives could be there, where else would, um, could that money be directed? Uh, thinking about training or knowledge hubs um, and this is something that's come through uh, at, earlier this week at the BCPC Congress. We've also got a decent way of, of assessing IPM adoption through both the Voluntary Initiative IPM Assessment Plan but also the DEFRA Pest and Disease Surveys as well um, and this is important because we need to have robust ways to measure the delivery of uh, IPM public goods and we feel like we've got that now. I'd um, just like to finish by saying that I know we've talked about IPM previously by thinking about the process for the farm and agronomist to go through, but IPM in terms of our communication um, uh, needs to be um, all encompassing. So we need to involve the, the consumer, the seller, the producer in this discussion, and all of these other factors need to be considered, the economic and the viability, environmental safety, social acceptability is becoming more and more important. We're having a lot of pressure put on um, farmers by the public and through the press quite often. Um, which uh, So we need to make sure that we're all uh, working together to, to allow for further IPM uptake and the associated public goods um, that will come from that. Just like to finish by thanking everyone involved, particularly the, the funders of the test and trial, DEFRA. Um, various people at uh, SOUC um, and NFU voluntary initiative contributed towards the IPM assessment plan and within the project uh, it was very well led by Chris Hartfield at the NFU and Phil Walker and Neil Paveley at ADAS. To thank John for his work on the land management tool and uh, all of those below for their um, work conducting all those behavioural insight interviews. 
Um, we look forward to receiving any of your questions at the panel discussion uh, at half 12. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henry and Holly. It was really interesting for you to so share the insights onto your IPM tool and sort of plans for, for ELMS going forwards. Um, as Henry said, uh, Zev, if you want if people can submit their questions to the Q&A um, panel, um, remember to put the speaker's name at the beginning of your question, then it helps us direct the, the question to the right person. That would be great. Thank you. So up next, we've got a slight uh, change of track now. Um, we've got two short presentations on um, uh, seed standards. So first up, we've got um, Stephen Flack from NIAB, who's a uh, joint head of the Agricultural Crop Characterization um, group together with Mark Wood Wallace. And so this group carries out um, testing on a range of agricultural of seed crops, as well as operating the seed um, standard certification scheme for England and Wales. So uh, thank you, Stephen. Right, so this is what NIAB gets up to in terms of seed certification work. Um, this is in addition to many other activities we do, which include the research and uh, seed testing and, uh, well, a lot of other things. I want to focus today um, mainly on uh, weed seeds, um, because I think that's probably one where the interest is from here today. And the spreading of these, of course, I won't cover things like the many means by which weed seeds are spread, uh, you know, wind and water, animals, soil, machinery. Um, I'll just really look at the possibility of contamination of sown seed and controls that might be on that. Um, and I think probably through the control of weed contamination and sown seed, we have one of the ways in which we can achieve some degree of control of how widely and how far seed weed seed gets distributed. So um, in terms of seed certification, uh, we do quite a lot of uh, work on it. But in terms of the standards to weed seed contents in, and other crop seed content in seed which is sold, and of course, all agricultural seed sold in this country has to be certified first, um, the, seed, the standards are mainly achieved through the seed test. That's the enforcement of sample of, of standards. Although a lot of the work towards making sure it's going to meet those standards happens at the crop stage and earlier. Um, and it can happen by, for instance, choose control within the, in, in the crop, weeding, application of herbicides and so forth, or it can be done by choice of crop areas to be harvested. If there's one particularly contaminated area, it may be possible to either leave it out of the harvest or harvest it separately for much harder cleaning. But the key thing is it's the seed as used, not the seed as produced, which matters. And so the standards are based on that and they are the maximum permitted. Although in fact, most of the seed which is sold uh, has contents of zero or others way below the maximum. Uh, for some weeds, you can uh, do field control of them. Uh, there are very few field standards for the presence of other species of plants. Uh, and field inspection, which we carry out on all seed crops, is mostly concerned with making sure it's the right variety and it is not mixed with other varieties. But that doesn't stop the possibility of um, drawing attention to weed contents and of, in some cases, applying standards to the maximums allowed. Field control can have significant effects in, in a few particular cases, uh, but also field observations can feed into which part of the crop or whether a crop is harvested at all if it's badly contaminated. We do have the right to refuse to examine a crop if there's enough weed and other covering it as to make the crop itself uh, impossible to see in, in good measure. So 
So looking at the field standards which do exist, um, I've got two in mind here. The first one is wild oats in cereal crops. Uh, wild oats have long been uh, an aim to restrict and control the spread of them, both on farm and between farm. One key way of doing that is by enforcing standards of uh, what is permitted in seed which is sold. Uh, what I put up here is part of the chart of the standards which are currently in force for seed. Now, cereal seed has several different generations. Uh, it has basic seed and pre-basic seed, which are essentially very high level generations, which are going to produce the rest of the crops further on. They're sown to produce crops of either CS or C1 seed, it's, it is the same generation, which in turn can be sown to produce crops of C2 seed, which is the final generation for most cereals. You can see that in oats, we operate a nil standard, that's to say one wild oat found in the crop, the crop fails, although it is possible, of course, to go and uh, rogue it for wild oats and be re-inspected. Uh, on top of this, the initial generations that also applied a higher voluntary standard and a minimum standard at which seed may be sold. And as you can see from the charts, if you look particularly at barley, uh, in the generations C1 and C2, the higher voluntary has significantly tighter controls on the presence of wild oats than does the minimum standard. And this is an effort to re restrict and reduce the amount of transmission of uh, wild oats in seed. The other place where you come across field standards is in the lolium species, the rye grasses. Um, in this case, it's for another reason, but the standard states that the number of plants per unit area, in this case, 50 square meters or 10 square meters of crop, cannot exceed uh, one plant. It's not done very strictly on that because we actually apply um, reject numbers, which make sure that the decision we've made is accurate to uh, one in 5% uh, or 95% accurate. Uh, so when inspecting a crop, you're expected to look for other species of ryegrass in the species you're inspecting. The reason for this is because uh, seed testing is not uh, allowed to, um, or is not able to pick out the different species of ryegrass with any degree of confidence. Uh, so the principal control has to be in the field where inspectors are trained to spot the differences between Italian ryegrasses, uh, perennial ryegrasses, and various hybrid ryegrasses, which may be around. Looking at the standards in seed testing, again, I stress these are maximum permitted and that maximum is usually well under that. Uh, the actual content of seed is usually well under that because seed companies uh, are keen to provide the best product they can. And also they're keen not to have it fail that the standards have to open the containers and re-clean it. Uh, so on two counts, that, that uh, works that way. Uh, you can see in this chart that, um, and I've just again presented you with a serial chart, but not the whole thing, because that would be boring in a short lecture of this sort. Uh, but if you look, you have the first column splits off all species from maize, because they're clearly very different uh, seed sizes going on there. So looking at the top set of lines there, you have the total of all other species uh, can't exceed 1% in basic HVS or 4% or sorry, one seed in basic HVS or four seeds in basic minimum standard. And then you say it goes up slightly as you go through the system. But uh, that's the total content of that. Other cultivated cereal species are, also have maximums applied to them. And there's also further maximums if you go across the page, 
for all species other than cultivated cereals, which means anything else that's in there. And special ones for wild oats, we already have zero standards going through, none to be found in the seed sample, and other named species as you go across the chart. Again, you have the split between HVS and minimum standards with higher um, standards being applied to the HVS, which is a voluntary scheme, uh, which is in this country. So that's a quick skim through what you get with certified seed produced in the UK and uh, what standards are applied to it. Uh, I should just point out though, that uh, one of the things with standards being applied to uh, seed is that uh, they are usually exceeded. You know, say there's, there's fewer seeds than are permitted. And that uh, whilst the wish of a farmer would be to receive seed with as few weed seeds in as possible, there has to be a, a level of um, compromise in that there's also a need for the farming industry to receive enough seeds each year of the species and varieties it needs to serve the area necessary. And if the standards were raised, which is a possibility, then of course production costs would go up and the price of seed would go up. So there has to be a degree of balance there, which is looked for and which in the certification system is covered by the fact we grow control plots of all seed lots that are produced to ensure that they're actually meeting the standards in a growing plot as well as as shown through tests. So now moving on to the category of imported seed, certified seed. Things have changed in the past year. Um, with the since beginning of 2021, uh, agricultural seed brought into the UK can no longer be certified and labelled under the EU seed schemes. So it now has to be certified under the OECD seed schemes. Uh, with the proof of seed standards, which are met by an ISTA test, the OIC test. Uh, that does not show it's met or passed the standards. Uh, it shows merely what standards the seed reaches in terms of actual contents and purity. And then is up to others to interpret whether that actually meets the minimum standards for sale in the UK. I should also say that seed coming into UK now uh, instead of the borders of EU being the point at which phytosanitary requirements were put in place, uh, phytosanitary is needed on all imported seed. And this does include a list of prohibited species of weeds and other things. And compliance with this is checked and enforced by the PHSI. So that's incoming certified seed should and does meet the same standards as, as the certified seed produced in this country. Um, looking at the standards in testing, which are achieved for vegetables, the vegetables have a slightly different procedure. Uh, they can be brought in as a yellow label uh, seed lot. This is standard seed, which is uh, slightly different in its um, conditions to certified seed. Certified seed, uh, requires field checks by under official control of some sort and also control plots to be grown. Standard seed uh, requires checks of its variety to be made by the company producing it, but it is also then required to meet seed standards, which are done by uh, an, a, a seed test. Once again, you will have guessed I've given you only part of this chart. There are many, many more vegetables that are listed here, but uh, it would have gone on a lot farther below this and you would not be able to read it had I put the whole thing there. But you can see in the second column, there was a minimum an an analytical purity percentage by weight. That means it must be at least 97% of the correct seed present in there. Um, the rest of that, 3% can be made up by various other things like broken seed or um, some soil or the other plant seeds, which can only go up to 0.5% in the first one for, for allium, which is onion. 
So the standards still exist there, but they are enforced at a different level. And the check that it is that the seed is meeting those standards is carried out by what's known as enforcement sampling, where samples are taken and checked officially to, to make sure they have actually reached the correct standards. And it seems to like this page, so it doesn't want to change. Right. Okay. So the, the next um, category I want to put in is another source of seed for farms, which is to save some seed from their own crops. And this is done by many farms. They take the, a good sample of seed from a crop they've grown already of a variety they would like to grow again. This seed, of course, is not a marketable category in this country. It cannot be sold without infringing one of the laws. But it also has no compulsory seed test or maximum permitted level of weed or other seeds in it. So the responsibility for checking that is with the person who's saving the seed to make sure they're not building up problems. And so it is important that the seed is not only tested for its content of weed seeds, but is properly sampled to make sure that the whole heap of seed they have or package or whatever they have is represented in the sample which is tested. There are methods for doing this, which are used under statutory testing, but just to grab a, a handful or two off the top of the heap does not give the results you would hope for. And finally, seed from other sources. Um, present we have the, the wonders of the internet have joined us. It used to be mail order, but now it's uh, internet and the far reaching that has. Um, and on the internet, there's a great deal of seed which is sold uh, over the internet, which originates either in Europe or UK or places beyond, which meets all the standards necessary for seed to be sold and used in this country. Uh, this is because there are international organizations that oversee the production of seed. And because in the main, there are many reputable companies out there marketing this seed and choosing to do it over the internet. However, some of the seeds sold over the internet comes from unknown sources. You only have the name and whatever is given to you on the screen you find and unknown locations. And it is not subject to the quality control, which would normally be uh, present in all the other groups of seed I've already mentioned. Uh, so it does contain the risk of carrying prohibited weed species as seeds within it, or even not being at all what you ordered. Um, I just point out though, that although much is said about this, and it is a real risk, uh, it shouldn't be blown out, out of proportion. It is not that huge. Um, it's just one thing that needs to be aware of when seeing a wonderful cheap deal somewhere, do consider what else it might bring to you. And finally, that seed coming into the country uh, is regulated by uh, PHSI and Customs, which is part of their duty on the phytosanitary and other systems. Uh, but bear in mind that the job of detecting small packets in a large quantity of letters and packages is not only difficult, but virtually impossible to be 100% certain. So on that sobering note, I'm going to finish my presentation Thank and you. move on to the next one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. So we'll swiftly move over to uh, Richard Barnes, who's sales manager at, at King's Crops, uh, responsible for the non-combinable sector. He's going to continue with our theme of seed certification. Over to you, Richard. Maybe without the slides. Maybe turn your video off. Yeah, OK. So I'll just just everybody uh, to give you an overview of the King's business. Just in charge of uh, combinable crops in the UK, including forage, grain, rye, uh, wheat, barley, oats, triticale, camelina, quinoa, borage. These are inspected in the field by our own in-house qualified crop inspectors and everything's processed and certified. 
certified at our site in DIS. We also work closely with a wide range of non-UK seed breeders and partners, um, and it's important that they understand exactly where where we are and what we require. So all our majority of our seed is, is either our own production or, or procured for our seed partners. Um, Stephen mentioned about Brexit and the UK national list, and that's a really important part of things. So any UK EU seed coming into us has to be on the UK list. If it's not on the UK list, it's unusable in the UK for ourselves. And all our seed is thoroughly analysed and tested through our seed plant at DIS. So we have our own DEFRA licensed satellite lab there, which enables to ensure that our own quality standards are up to spec and uh, where they need to be. The scrutiny is applied throughout our system, so from our operatives um, outside in the in the warehousing and on the waybridge. Um, so there's firewalls right the way through the system, and that, that's a critical part of what we're doing. So everything on intake um, is fully assessed in terms of germination, vigour and purity. Um, we spent a considerable amount of money at our site in DIS with a dedicated facilities, and this helps to us ensure that we get to the right the right specifications. All of our seed mixtures, mixtures must have a green certification label attached to the bag. And uh, these should be either adhered uh, as in a less than 10 kilo bag or a 20 or 10 kilo plus, plus must be stitched into the bag itself. And in a mixture terms, this will cover a range of criteria. So mixture use, so agricultural, mm -hmm. a seed reference lot number, so it can be tracked back to our store and our particular stock lot reference, weight of seed, volume of seed, and source as well is really important. So we'll list whether it's UK or non-UK seed and all that the certifying for authority details are on the bottom as well. So when there's any inspection on farm, the grower knows that it's fully trackable back to back to ourselves. It's been covered this morning by Gary and Alistair about the evolving sectors and the previous presentations about IPM. So cover crops, catch crops, companion crops, IPM, soilborne pest management, and very relevant at the moment, homegrown nutrition. So how to make the most of the available resources in, in our soils and increase those and make them more accessible for our crops is really important. So just to summarize, non-combinable combinable crops in our world are absolutely just as important as combinable crops. And as a, one of the leading suppliers in the industry, we see it's critical that we set our own standards high and work on an HVS standard wherever we can and also to sort of set the standard across the industry to ensure that everybody's working on the same high standards where possible. Growers need high quality seed. This might be previously a niche area, but it's critical to have the quality of seed that they have, not only from a get best practice perspective, but from a compliance perspective from cross compliance and seed inspection purposes. And I'm active in the field talking with growers daily, and I need to know from a personal perspective that what I'm supplying in a bag is of the highest possible quality, and that's the same for the rest of my team. And we're really pleased to be working closely with PHSI, AHPPA, and DEFRA teams, because it's a really good partnership. We're working together. They're giving us guidance, and we're sharing new and novel best practice techniques. So apologies for the, the network, network issues, and thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thank you very much, Richard. And um, yeah, sorry for the technical issues. So if we could have the um the panelists uh, the um speakers back on and we'll have a, a short panel discussion now. So Alistair, we'll kick off with you. Um so broader than weeds, but given the drive to reduce meat and dairy consumption for net zero reasons, what do you think the future is for the 70% of agricultural land currently growing grass for livestock? And is regenerative farming with livestock compatible with a net zero approach? There's quite a challenge there, isn't there? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Sorry to give you a difficult one. <laughs> well, let's start with that 70% of, of what is mostly permanent pasture. <clears throat> I think we've got to remember that that's a huge carbon sink in the pasture land and if we're to plow that up to to grow crops for human consumption that the, the loss of carbon from that soil has got to be taken into account as well um, the advantages of bringing uh, grass into arable systems is the same in that it, it builds stability and soil carbon within it and i think perhaps the the, the exciting opportunities for the industry are actually to look look, look at um, animal breeding 
to reduce emissions because that's not something that we've done much of and also looking at, um, at different types of, of feed type um, for reducing those enteric uh, emissions. We've been doing some work here on tree forage, particularly looking at willow and um, it's this is really useful in suppressing the gaseous emissions from livestock. So, um, you know, there's a lot of options here. This isn't a black and white scenario. Thank you. Um, one for Gary here. So with wheat harvest finishing in the first 10 days of September and drilling on heavy land aiming to finish by mid-October, do we have time to establish and benefit from cover crops? And if we do, what mixture would you advise? Well, you have time to do it, but you won't get any benefit Sorry, that was out one of for it. Gary. <laughs> Um, it's, uh, yeah, that is a problem. Um, not always time. Um, it's something I'm learning about. I think if there's a four week window, uh, then it's worth uh, sort of going in, trying to establish something. Um, I have played around with establishing my cash crop into the cover crop and then giving it maybe another week, 10 days before I then go in with a, um, glyphosate plus the pre M mix. So that sort of buys you a little bit more time as well. Um, that that can work, um, and even possibly in a spring uh, crop, if if I get my cover crop sown in the autumn and it doesn't get too uh, sort of vigorous and tall over winter, also going in with after it's drilled in the spring, liquid fertilizer, glyphosate, and the pre M mix. Um, and again, that, that's all sort of helping my carbon footprint, doing three jobs in one. Um, but yeah, as for autumn sown cover crops, it is difficult. I may in, end up introducing winter barley into the rotation so that that comes off in sort of more reliably in sort of early July, giving me a chance to establish a cover crop, possibly before then sowing oilseed rape um, or, ju or just to sort of get these cover crops away it's also about rainfall if you can get it in in mid-august and you know you're going to get a rain on your cover crop seed it really flies out the ground um that that extra time in august rather than being in september soil conditions are better warmer it really flies out the ground um seed species wise um i just a lot of what i've got kicking about i've played a bit more with buckwheat this year um, I'm looking at sort of the um, crops with a sort of good sort of uh, that uh, what's the word uh, sort of good biological sort of in the soil um, get the sort of mycorrhizal fungi going in there um, things that can do that as much as possible so the, the buckwheat the oats are good um, growing linseed on the farm I'll put that back in um, pretty much anything if I'm going in with a cereal then I won't put the cereal in before the cash crop. Again, if I'm going in with a legume, then I'll keep the legumes out before the legume cash crop. Um, the AHDB have, have a good report on this, um, one of their projects, a uh, good paper, um, all about the cover cropping. Uh, and that was one of the sort of key findings. Okay. Um, so just, just as, as much variety as possible, um, as much as you can home save um, from, from your own sort of store at home, and um, but okay, this does rely on uh, the, the glyphosate to take it out. Yeah. So um, yeah. So thank you. Thanks. Um, one for Henry here. Um, is there a difference in the uptake or understanding of IPM control options for weeds as opposed to diseases and pests? And similarly, um, are the are the barriers to uptake similar for for the different categories? Um. So looking at the different types of pest i suppose um as i mentioned earlier in the talk some people who have adopted particular systems have particular pest weed disease issues and um, so that whole sort of system particularly when we're talking about whether you're going for a plow base or not and um, that does have implications in terms of the pest weeds disease you're going to have to deal with and, and also the, the sorts of measures you have uh, available to get on top of those and um, so yeah there is a consideration there okay thank you and holly if um, economic and environmental factors are key drivers for adoption how do farmers know whether any individual measure has an economic or environmental benefit um, if it's not easily quantified how might that affect adoption that's a very good question um 
And it is potentially very difficult to quantify specific impacts that individual measures might have economic and environmentally you know, at the farm level. And it is important to try and quantify these impacts as they are have emerged as such significant drivers. And for example, a lot of interviewees call for research and support of successful IPM practices and to actually be able to go on farm and see the impacts um, of case study farms, for example, of farms that have implemented successful IPM practices. So really keen to see the demonstrable benefits of IPM practices they could implement. Um, and again, highlighted that independent and credible research was a really good way to see those impacts. Um, and this is something that could be prioritised going forward to encourage the adoption. Um, but Henry, I don't know if you've got anything else to add to that as well. No, it's something that many have tried to do. And um, it's, for some measures, it's much easier than others to quantify the environmental and ecological benefits. And um, IPM is uh, the first led that is integrated. So actually trying to tease out the relative uh, economic and environmental benefits of specific measures when they're used in conjunction with others is, is the tricky part. And, and there are reviews on uh, ongoing now that are trying to sort of tease out those differences. Um, because if we can identify that there are clear, particularly with uh, economic advantages to adopting certain techniques, um, it's it's um, reasonable to assume that they, um, if we can demonstrate that they're important, they're consistent in terms of what they deliver, it's reasonable to assume that they will be uh, readily uptaken. Thanks. Um, so I think Stephen's had to disappear, but kindly one of his colleagues has, has stepped in. So, um, so Tim, um, I've got a question. What happens if pernicious weed species are found in samples, but they're not on the watch list? Is there any measures to... Well, no, there isn't. Uh, no, well, there isn't. But obviously, uh, a company selling seed, if there's pernicious weed in there that uh, they wouldn't want to sell or wouldn't want to have in their seed lot, most companies will, you know, keep that out. And you, as an inspector, if you went to look at uh, any seed crops, you would raise that if you saw something that was not on the watch list, as it were, that you felt was going to be an issue with that seed lot, you would raise it. They would then look at it and either reject that field uh, outright, which does happen, you know, several times a year where, you know, the crop obviously is not, doesn't cut the mustard as it were. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that would, it's, 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 that's how it's sort of dealt with really on that, that front. Yeah. Um, Alistair, if I can come back to you, um, could you comment on the implications of the inclusion of grass lays within or organic systems for the incidence of leather jackets in subsequent wheat crops? And also on a similar vein, sort of crop residues um, impacts on fungal pathogen inc incidents such as Sectoria and BYDV. We didn't experience any problems with leather jackets. Why, I don't know, because we've certainly seen it subsequently when we've um, had uh, multi-species lays and then gone into um, wheat crops in a, in a non-organic system. Um, with the disease uh, issue, BYDV was never a problem um, in the organic system because of the late sowing, the November drilling that we carried out. And crop diseases generally seem to be at lower levels. And I think that's probably a great deal to do with the nitrogen status within the plant um, because um, nitrogen is plant derived it is slower released and it seems to give a higher to carbon nitrogen ra ratio within the plant which makes them less susceptible to diseases but those were only observations okay thank you um henry um so you you covered elms which is obviously england but what is happening in the scottish sector in, in respect to elms do you have any do you have you got any insider info on what is the plans going forwards i'm sorry i don't Nicola. okay <laughs> <laughs> and also to henry um do you know what extent varietal selection um um is considered sorry to what extent varietal selection considers weed suppressive qualities relative to say disease resistance or yield potential so uh, weed competitiveness was a, about the same in terms of how the um, IPM stakeholders were valuing it as yield potential and um, insect pest resistance as well. But uh, they valued uh, disease resistance as being probably one of the most important factors you should consider when um, selecting varieties according to their IPM potential. Okay. Um 
think we're going to run out of time for the discussion section, but um, a final one for Alistair. In the um, Cultivations Conservation Ag project, how long is the project in total? And do you expect things to change for the greater length of time that the different thirds of the field stay in any one system? Yeah, the, the longer you can do these things, the, the, the better the information you get. So uh, the project started in 2017 mm -hmm. and goes on to 2022. So it's five fields uh, with five different crops in which move around the farm, keeping those same cultivation regimes in, in place. Uh, and we are now looking at a two year extension beyond 2022, particularly to get data on carbon and soil uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the soil, uh, because those are starting to change uh, through the systems. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, that, that's what we plan. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think as we're sort of looking a little short on time if there's, there's some remaining questions in in the uh, q a panel if the um, speakers could uh, type those answers in if they have time that, that would be great thank you um so we'll now move on to our um sort of virtual poster session uh, we've only got one um presenter today which is Odinkemi Okawalmeki, hopefully I've pronounced that in a kind of okay way who's studying uh, for a phd at reading university um and it's uh, sponsored by the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission and his research involves working with small scale resource poor farmers in Nigeria. So it's going to give a, a short presentation and then slides will be um, on a slideshow over lunch, which uh, you can review and then send questions in direct via the Q&A panel. OK, thank you. Over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Adin Kemdeme Okwama Ike. I'll be presenting, it's actually a poster, but I'll be talking with the slides and end up with the poster because of disability um, reasons. So opportunities for more precise weed management in low land rice farms in southeastern Nigeria. Okay. Rice is the most important crop in Nigeria, uh, but the country imports up to 40% of the rice, which is eaten in Nigeria. The major problem with rice production is weeds. The weeds are, are, are a major problem and 100% loss of yield is not uncommon in the area. But this project is about um, um, looking at the, the weed distribution. If the weeds are especially very well distributed, then the farmers may optimize control by directing interventions to the patches rather than what they do, what they, what they do that's uniform application of herbicides and, and hand weeding. So the, the, what we did was to, first of all, investigate the farmer's perspective by questionnaires. We gave questionnaires to 281 respondents who were lowland rice farmers in the area. And then we looked at what they were saying. Most of them were talking about uh, uh, two results for two weed species have been presented here. That's Nife maculata and uh, Echinochloa species. So most of the farmers were saying that uh, Nife maculata was mostly observed, higher densities of Nife maculata were observed at the flooded portions of the field, while uh, um, higher densities of echinoclorus species were observed at the lower density, lower, lower, at the less flooded portions of the field. Uh, I'd like to note that this project is about introducing precision agriculture to be small scale resource poor farmers without technology. So the, the next step was to, back to the, to the results. The next step was to investigate the farmer's claims, which we have done here. We, you can find out, if you look at the maps over, over, over here, you find out that the, the maps in the middle refer to flooding depths. You see that Nife maculata is mostly observed at deeper flooded parts, and Echinocloa is mostly observed at uh, less flooded parts. This suggests that the farmers are correct in the observation that the flooding is associated with the distribution of the weeds in their in individual fields. What, what was very interesting to us is that the farmers immediately began to adopt site-specific weed management after the study. We observed that some of them were applying herbicides, different kinds of herbicides to various parts of their fields based on the, the, the flooding depth and the weed, weed, the weed density and which species they, have, they expected at different parts of the field. Others uh, moved from uh, a traditional uh, uh, field-wide hand weeding 
to a patch-based handwriting. And when I mean patch-based handwriting, I'm talking about, um, for example, a part of the field where tough grassy weeds are is weeded for a thousand naira, and then only two hundred naira is used to weed uh, uh, other parts of the field where broadleaf weeds are. So that, those are the kind of things. Others were using hired labor to weed more weedy parts and family labor to weed less weedy parts. So these are the things we introduce to the farmers. In, in the future, the farmers could demarcate these portions as weed management zones. They could use bonds to, to secure the flooding at more flooded parts to ensure that these portions remain weed free all through the seasons while they concentrate their uh, control measures at less flooded parts where they observe Welcome back, everybody, and welcome to anybody who's just joining us for this afternoon. I hope you all had a good lunch. Um, we're going to start this afternoon's session with a, a quick handover to Barry Hunt, who's BCPC Weeds Group Chair, and he's going to give us an introduction to the BCPC database. Okay, over to you, please, Barry. Uh, thank you, Nicola. I'll uh, just uh, quickly share my screen. Hopefully this will work for everybody. Um, let me just go to here. Um, just very quickly, um, just to let everybody know that uh, on the B, uh, BCPC website at bcpc.org, besides all the presentations from the various reviews, weed review, et cetera, um, there is also a whole, we're developing a whole uh, wealth of other information. And um, quite simply, if you uh, go on and you click, I'll just get me magic wand. Uh, if you go on and you click on uh, open, uh, oops, don't know why it appeared over there, and click on open access, um, you can then access two databases. There's the free access database and there's the knowledge bank database. Um, if you go to the free access database in here, there's a whole, there are three different uh, databases. There's the uh, compendium of uh, pesticide common names. There's uh, Identipest, which is an online resource for the identification of weeds, pests, diseases, etc. And there's also a lot of information on uh, biotech crops. There's a biotech crop database there. Uh, these ones have been around for a while. What's I think what we're finding is, is most exciting is the development of the new knowledge bank. Um, this is gradually being developed, and our aim is to include over 50 years of conference and symposia proceedings, and there'll be access to over 60,000 pages of information, lots of valuable info in there, um, and uh, it'll be it is searchable. Um, we're still, I have to say that it's progressing nicely, uh, but we're still, it's not perfect yet, but uh, it's all going to be there. Uh, it will be uh, uh, free to view. Um, and just to show you that at the moment, for example, we've got a whole list of publications. That's an example. We've got some of the BCP, for example, the BCPC Symposium on Applications and Biology. Uh, and then there's some of the uh, conference proceedings. And our aim is to put on all the information right the way back to the 1950s. And it'll be there and you'll be able to search for it. Just important to highlight the fact that this work, uh, which is part of the BCPC's uh, charitable objectives in providing information, has also been supported by a number of agricultural charities. And they were really grateful to their help and assistance. Um, a little, so, so it's ongoing, it's being built up, uh, most of the information is in there, we're just perfecting the search tools. Um, we are hoping if we can get finance uh, as well to add a lot of the information, the old reports from uh, the Weed Research Organization, uh, because again, there's incredibly valuable information in there, but at the moment, if you haven't got a copy of it on your shelf, it doesn't exist. So hopefully we can, we can build onto that. Um, but that's all I wanted to say, uh, and so it, it's there, bcpc.org, and uh, click on Open Access. 
Thank you, Barry. That looks like it's a really useful resource. So just to run through this afternoon's programme, um, next up we've got um, Helen Metcalf from Rothamsted, who's going to be discussing um, her work on modelling the effects of glyphosate loss in no-till and plough-based systems. Uh, following that, we've got Brian Taylor, who's going to be um, informing us on IWM elements in, in the amenity sector. And we're finishing up today with Richard Hull from Rossumstead, who's going to be discussing what IWM strategies and tactics UK arable farmers are employing for weed control. So, um, Helen, if you'd like to start sharing your screen. And as ever, um, if you could please put your Q&As for this, this afternoon speakers in the Q&A um, panel. And if you start your question with the speaker's name, then we'll know who to direct the, the questions to. So Dr. Helen Metcalf is a weed ecologist and ecosystems modeler at Rothamsted Research, and her work focuses on modeling the response of weed communities to changes in management practice, both in terms of crop production and ecosystems and service delivery. Thank you. Over to you, Helen. Thanks, Nicola. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk to you today about um, this piece of work that we've been doing as part of the ASSIST programme, which is a joint programme between Rothamsted Research and UKCEH. Um, we've been investigating some of the potential effects of glyphosate loss in the UK, um, particularly sort of focusing on a, a holistic view of glyphosate loss. So not only thinking about the impacts on the weed communities, but also on profit, food production, and also the environmental impact of herbicides. There's been quite a few studies looking at various IWM options um, for when we might lose glyphosate. Um, but we sort of wanted to bring together all these different strands um, in a modelling approach. So, forward, there we go. We use the Rothamsted landscape model, which is a crop and soil model um, into which we built in a weed community model. Um, so, using this, we can look at the effects of management on the weed community, but also on the crop production. Um, and other dynamics within the system. We simulated two example min-till farms in the east of England uh, with medium clay content soils. Um, so these example farms, uh, we determined to use standard agronomic practices. So for each crop within a standard uh, typical crop sequence, uh, we set typical sowing dates, typical planting densities, uh, things like that to give us a sort of baseline from which to investigate alternative scenarios. The two farms, the difference between them is that they have different starting weed communities. Uh, one is a typical weed community from the early 2000s for this region, um, which means that there's not really any um, herbicide resistant blackgrass. The weed community is dominated by Poa annua. Um, and then farm B, our second farm that we simulated, uh, is more typical of a farm with widespread herbicide resistant blackgrass. Uh, this was just to sort of give us an indication of whether the different IWM strategies um, for coping with glyphosate loss could have different effects uh, if the weed community uh, has herbicide resistance or not. Um, we ran all our simulations for 10 years using continuous weather data from the region um, but to investigate the effects of varying weather, we uh, changed the start here of the simulation. So we've got uh, lots of different weather data from 1970 uh, all the way through to the present day. When I said that in the, the farming systems, we're using typical agronomic practices, I wanted to just concentrate a little bit on what that means in terms of the herbicides um, and the weed control. So the different, if you imagine this is a timeline of, of one cropping season, the different uh, agronomic operations can happen at different times. Um, and the, the time between these operations will affect the proportion of weed seeds germinating from different groups. Um, so if you sow later, for example, you'll get more weeds emerging before the crop is in. Um, and if you cultivate later, you, you would be able to kill off more weeds using that mechanical. Um, weed control. 
We also determined a typical herbicide program for each crop um, using the DEFRA pesticide usage survey. Uh, so for example, this is the herbicide program we apply in winter wheat. We've got two applications of glyphosate pre-sowing, uh, a pre-emergence diflufenican, and then post-emergence Atlantis and starring. Um, and so similarly for the other crops, we also determined a typical pesticide program. And then for each of those products, um, we have a dose response curve. So these different curves represent different weed species. Um, and this is for different doses of Atlantis. These are the different percentage kill levels we get if we apply at field rate for the different weed species. So using um, this combination of uh, modeling approaches, we can simulate what would happen under typical um, crop rotation scenarios and typical agronomic practices. Um, so as our baseline scenario, uh, we include all those typical practices, including the use of glyphosate. So for example, in winter wheat, there's two pre-sowing applications of glyphosate. We also simulated a scenario with no glyphosate, and this was just to investigate the effect of the loss of glyphosate without replacing it with any other management interventions. Um, and then we also looked at four different scenarios where we implemented integrated weed management practices to replace the glyphosate. So these focused either on changing the crop rotation by increasing the frequency of grass lays or by increasing the frequency of spring cereals within the crop rotation. And the second set of principles we focused on was uh, stale seed bed management. Um, so we either delayed the drilling of winter wheat crops by three weeks um, to allow for greater emergence before the sowing of the winter wheat crop. Um, or we switched from minimum tillage to ploughing. Um, and the, in this case, the ploughing primarily acts as a mechanical form of weed control um, within that, that S2 scenario. So we're going to concentrate, first of all, on the results for weed abundance. So in each of those scenarios, you can see along the bottom here, uh, G and G, R1, R2, S1 and S2 and in each of the farms, we run 100 simulations. So there's 100 data points in each of these um, plots. And as you can see, there's, there's quite a lot of variation there. So I've also plotted the distribution of those data just to give a little bit of a clearer picture. Um, in a way, this is surprising. Like it's a modeling study we would expect to sort of see some clear cut patterns, which we don't. Um, but when you think about experimental studies that have done similar things, the variation in uh, weed response can be huge. Um, so for example, um, I think it was one of Peter's papers where he showed, uh, for example, a switch to plowing from minimum tillage can cause a 80, plus 80% 80 or minus 80% change in the population. Um, so we see the same thing here in the modeling study. What is different about this modeling study, though, is that in each of these scenarios, there are paired data points. So one of the data points from this set of data matches exactly one of the data points here. So where the only difference between them is the change that we have made to the management. So the weather is exactly the same. All the stochastic elements of the model are exactly the same. Um, so using an approach like this, we can really start to tease apart the effects of the management um, in isolation from all the other things that might cause this huge variation. Uh, before I move on to the results of the analysis where we, we could use this modeling to tease apart these effects, I just wanted to point out from this raw data that in all of our simulations, the only time where we got to a near zero weed population was when we used glyphosate in the simulations. Uh, none of the other scenarios did we ever get close to a zero weed population. So when we use some linear models to try and pull apart the effects of the management alone on um, weed abundance, we can see that it is definitely the scenario where we use glyphosate that we get the lowest weed abundance across our simulations. Um, the scenario where we switch to plowing does have significantly more weeds than in the glyphosate scenario. However, it does outperform the other four scenarios. So it's much uh, better at controlling weeds than when we just remove glyphosate or even when we 
introduce these other IWM practices. So that's introducing increased frequency of crash slays, spring serials, or delayed drilling. Um, so if we have to lose glyphosate, then the, the next best scenario that we investigated in terms of weed control uh, was a switch to plowing. So mechanically controlling those weeds prior to the crop sowing. However, when we think about the downstream effects of controlling those weed populations, uh, one of the key goals we might be interested in is the amount of food that we can produce. Um, we converted the food production to calories here rather than looking at crop yield, because obviously in some of these scenarios we're changing the rotation, um, in which case the yields aren't really comparable um, because there'll be different crops growing. But when we look at the amount of food that's produced um, after three, five, and 10 years, you can see in this third panel here, uh, obviously the, the amount of food produced goes up over time. Um, this is cumulative uh, food production. But we can see that uh, in general on the farm where we have herbicide resistance, food production is significantly lower um, than in the farm without herbicide resistance. But what's interesting here is the difference between scenarios. So we get the highest food production uh, in both the glyphosate scenario and the plowing scenario. Um, but what is really interesting is that these are not significantly different from the no glyphosate scenario. So when we withdraw glyphosate and don't replace it with any form of integrated weed management, we actually still produce the same amount of food overall. So that increased weed population isn't significantly affecting the food production over a 10 year time series. Um, where we do see significant losses in food production is actually where we introduce the integrated weed management. Um, but in a way, this is not surprising. So by introducing an increased frequency of grass lays, for example, um, we're not producing a, a food crop there. Um, similarly, when we introduce more spring cereals, these are lower yielding than the winter counterpart. Um, so although they do help to control the wheat population to some extent, um, it doesn't provide uh, sufficient additional food production to, to counteract that, that change in crop choice. The food production clearly links through to how much profit uh, we're going to make. Um, again, the, the farm with increased herbicide resistance uh, gives significantly lower profits than the, the farm without herbicide resistance. But what's interesting here is that over the, the time series of our simulations, so from three years of solid black line to five years to 10 years of simulation, the relative effect of these different scenarios changes. So after three years of simulation, the lowest profits are achieved when we uh, introduce delayed drilling. Now, what happened here is in a, a small number, but a significant number of our simulations, uh, when we chose to delay the drilling of the winter wheat, the crop did not establish in our models. Um, and because the model is not really reactive, we couldn't then also sow a spring crop that, that following year or anything. So we actually lost some crops in this scenario. Um, but in the long term, this kind of evens out. So in the five years and 10 years, the, the lowest profits are achieved. Uh, in the R1 scenario where we increase the frequency of grass lays. Again, this is because it's not a food crop um, when we introduce those grass lays. And so um, we're currently not accounting for any profits from that, that crop. Um, but those short-term losses in the S1 scenario are uh, dissipated over the long term. So generally we can, after 10 years, we can earn as much profits um, in the majority of these IWM scenarios as we could do when we used glyphosate. So despite significant uh, increases in weed abundance and some potential losses in food production, the profits uh, for the long-term um, scenarios are not altered. We also uh, thought about the environmental impact of herbicides. So, these scores are calculated uh, taking into account the hazard associated with each chemical, so the, the toxicity to things like birds and bees and 
fish uh, and also the potential of that chemical to leach into uh, streams and rivers and also to stay in the soil matrix or on a plant. So it's a combination of the hazard of the chemical and the risk to different groups. Um, and we considered groundwater, birds, bees, fish and beneficial arthropods uh, in the calculation of this score. And what we can see again here is that there are significant differences between our scenarios, uh, but also that the relative importance of those scenarios changes over time. So in the short term, uh, year three, which is this solid black line here, the scenario with the highest environmental impact is the glyphosate scenario. All of the integrated weed management scenarios are significantly less impactful on the environment in terms of the herbicides they used um, than when we use glyphosate. However, as we move towards the long term, the R2 scenario becomes significantly worse than even in the case of using glyphosate. Now, the R2 scenario is one where we increase the frequency of spring cereals. Um, and if I take you back to those standard pesticide programs that we derive from the pesticide usage survey, um, the chemicals that are typically used in spring crops in the UK, well, in spring cereals in the UK, are typically more environmentally damaging than in other crops. And so by increasing the frequency of those crops um, in our simulations, we actually have this, this sort of unintended consequence of increasing the environmental impact of the herbicides used over and above the scenario where we used glyphosate. I just wanna remind you that in these other scenarios, um, we didn't replace glyphosate use with any other chemicals. This was purely uh, using the typical herbicides that were used uh, as standard in those crops um, and without replacing it. So the, the only change in the chemicals that are applied uh, was removing the use of glyphosate, but by changing the crop rotation, we can increase the environmental impact. So to sort of draw it to a, a bit of a close there, there was um, lots of variation in our results, um, which is, kind of to be expected based on how, um, how much variation we see in weed communities and the response to different IWM practices. Um, and if this were an experimental study, it'd be very difficult to draw conclusions from um, those isolated results. However, the paired nature of our simulations allow us to tease out the effects of the management um, by isolating the effects independently from the weather and the stochastic elements of the model. Um, so this kind of highlights the benefit of using a modelling approach uh, in this situation. Um, we can say that glyphosate use does significantly improve weed control compared to IWM options. However, the downstream effects, including food production and profit, can be mitigated through IWM. So although we might have a higher weed community, um, I didn't show you the results here, but we also had higher diversity within that weed community. Um, and so the downstream effects on food production were definitely lower than you might expect from that increased weed abundance. Um, I do want to note there again that we didn't explore the use of introducing alternative chemicals, so we've literally removed one chemical and replaced it with cultural control practices. Um, it might be interesting also to explore the use of replacing the glyphosate use with alternative chemicals that could be less environmentally damaging. Um, the relative benefits of the different strategies that we explored do change over time. Uh, so whether you have a short-term perspective or a long-term perspective, you might choose different options um, in terms of uh, food production, weed control, things like that. A switch from minimum tillage to plowing can be beneficial, um, but obviously there are sort of consequences of switching to plowing that, that were outside the scope of this study. Um, but that's something that, that would need to be considered uh, in terms of soil health, things like that. Um, and the herbicide resistance status does reduce both food production and profits. But key, I think, to, to these results is that it doesn't impact the relative efficacy of the different IWM management options. So the, the 
best scenario for each of the different metrics was the same whether there was herbicide resistance or not. Um, but the best option does depend on which metric you consider to be the most important and also the time scale that you're thinking about. So it changes whether you're looking at short term perspective or long term perspective, and it changes whether you're interested in food production or environmental impact. So I think suffice to say it's complicated. Um, there definitely are options for uh, surviving a loss of glyphosate. Um, but there's definitely more to be explored. So thank you for your time, and I'm happy for any questions. Thanks very much, Helen. As you say, a complicated scenario. Um, if people could put their um, questions for Helen and also um, this afternoon's other speakers. Into the Q&A panel, that would be, be great. We can go through them at the discussion session. So next up, we have uh, Brian Taylor, who's going to be uh, talking to us about IWM in the amenity sector. So Brian Taylor has a lot of experience with invasive weeds. Um, he says he's been working with them since he was 16 years old. And he's been specialising in commercial invasive weed management since 2004, uh, working with species such as Japanese knotweed, giant hogweed, field horsetail and other species such as bamboo. So over to you, Brian, and we'll learn all about in integrated weed management in amenity. OK, thank you, Nicola. Hope everyone can hear me. Right. Um, talk today about integrated weed management elements in amenity. So what is amenity? Oops. Right. Amenity areas are anything that is not agriculture or commercial horticulture or possibly forestry. And we cover a very diverse area indeed. As you can see from the snappy little diagram here of the Swiss Army penknife, we cover lots of areas. Find some uh, Premier League grounds to the industrial estate verges on hard surfaces. So what situations will an amenity weed expert encounter? Well, typically we might deal with hard surfaces, invasive weeds, sports turf, amenity planting, conservation areas, nature reserves, amenity woodland, amenity grass, etc. And there's a great number of sites that are covered by etc, including organic farms. We actually treat invasive weeds on a number of organic farms. Now amenity has a few specific problems that are fairly unique to it really. And the sites are usually open access, so we have public around us, we have pets, we have children. We have multiple stakeholders and user group from the friends of group of groups of parks to the Greens Committee, etc. We're often working near water and environmentally sensitive areas and problems, especially the invasive weeds, can be cross boundary issues. In fact, often are. We also have a very limited number of active ingredients for herbicides and the presence of services and other features as well may very well impact on the alternative methods of control we might consider using. And finally, the big problem, budget constraints. Nobody really wants to spend money on this amenity weed problem. Now, my specialist area is invasive terrestrial weeds. So I'm going to focus on that today. Now here we have um, schedule nine weeds. Now these are weeds that are covered by legislation, the Wildlife and Countryside Act. And basically, it's a offence to encourage them to grow in the wild. What exactly that means, encourage and the wild is a difficult area and it's not really, really been that well defined. But the post child for the Schedule 9 plants is, of course, Japanese knotweed. It also has a number of hybrids with giant knotweed, Himalayan knotweed and a Russian vine. But included in Schedule 9 are some well-known plants like Toniasta, giant hogweed, hottentot fig, Himalayan balsam, rhododendron, azalea, mombrisha, giant rhubarb, Japanese rose, Virginia creeper, false creeper, and others. Now, not covered in Schedule 9, we've got the bamboo species that are invasive, some of them, field horsetail, budlia, giant butterbur, Himalayan knotweed, which is a close cousin of Japanese knotweed and does hybridize with it, and is currently increasing. So why it's not in Schedule 9, I don't know. 
Now, it's, it is not illegal to buy or sell or to plant either Schedule 9 or non-Schedule 9 invasive plants in the UK. So I can go down to my local garden centre, I can buy Cotone Aster, I can buy Rhododendron, I can buy Azalea, Mondrisha, Giant Rhubarb, Japanese Rose, etc. Not many garden centres sell Japanese knotweed, that's just too much for them, I think, but it's not actually illegal. So looking at integrated weed management for invasive weeds, we've got prevention as the a bottom. Now I've adapted this triangle a little, little bit for invasive weeds and what I've put in, in the second tier is early detection and monitoring. If you can't stop it, you've got to detect it early on so you can deal with it, you have more options, maybe more time. And you're going to use less herbicide or less physical means if you do pick it up early. Then of course you've got the physical mechanical methods which vary from species to species, biological control, there's a couple out there for invasive species. For most of the invasive, invasive species that we deal with, there just isn't any biological, any biological control. Then, of course, we have chemicals or herbicide. Now, Japanese knotweed is the poster child of the invasive plants. And to briefly summarize why that is, it's a perennial plant. It forms large monocultures or colonies. And by large, I mean hectares. You know, I know areas in South Wales where there are blocks of Japanese knotweed covering three or four hectares. And when you say to the client, that is one plant covering all that area, it then puts things in perspective. That's a huge problem for us to deal with. Now, we've only got one female clone of Japanese knotweed in the whole of Europe. We've got no male Japanese knotweed. So no male, no sex, no seed. But it does spread by vegetative means, by propagules, we call them. And that's fragments of rhizomes, fragments of crown, even a two node stem section, which will then grow into new plants, new colonies. And it spreads by soil disturbance, for example, on, the, on, on excavators, tracks, through streams and flood events. It has deep rhizomes as networks, typically two meters uh, depth, my personal record is four and a half metres. It goes down deep in some situations. It grows in any soil type, any situation. I found it in salt marshes, mountaintops, growing on cliff, on a cliffs, anywhere. Environmentally damaging. That's the big problem, really. It forms a vast monoculture. And in that monoculture, you will not find much ecology. You might find a few wood lice in the leaf litter. That's about it, really. You won't find any other plants, usually. Usually, that's it. And of course, it's damaging. It's damaging not only environmentally, it's damaging to hard surfaces, walls, structures, even buildings. And we're also now finding a lot of hybrids. Although there's no male Japanese knotweed, the female clone of Japanese knotweed will readily hybridize with giant knotweed, Himalayan knotweed, Russian vine, compact Japanese knotweed, which is another but related species. So looking at this tip of this situation here, we're going to see if we can apply our IWM triangle. So looking at the top picture, the client called us out to look at this site and to do a quote. Obviously the Japanese knotweed is growing between the wall and their outbuilding in the back garden here. It's also spreading into the public footpath and the pavement onto the road. Now, Clearly, we can't prevent it. That's, that's far too late. Early detection monitoring, again, it's too late. Physical mechanical. In, there are a couple of options here we could talk about. We could do a full-scale excavation of the Japanese knotweed. That would necessitate the wall coming out, the outbuilding being demolished, and the foundations grubbed out, the footpath being excavated, the pavement being excavated, dealing with any services in, in the area as well. That's an extreme physical case. All the waste has to go as controlled waste to a licensed landfill. And of course, you have to reinstate. Not cheap. Or you could do, as we suggested, do a herbicide program with some integrated management to deal with the dead canes in the winter to facilitate access, possibly raking out some of the live material. We did offer the client a herbicide program on that basis. They went away to think about it. 
After nine months, after uh, nine months, they came back to us. The bottom picture is what we found. Early spring, the knotweed is starting to swell, to grow, develop new buds. It put pressure on the wall, where it was sandwiched between the wall and the outbuilding, and the wall went over. At that point, we had to implement our program. But as the wall was actually gone, we could actually get more of the live material out and away, which, which, facilitate, which facilitated our ongoing herbicide program. Just to show this not a unique situation, classic case here of a retaining wall with the knotweeds behind it. Spring, the wall spills up and over the wall goes. Very common. Now this is one of my fairly, I think, situations which I was quite pleasantly surprised when I took this picture. It looks quite good. Pavement blocked by a Japanese knotweed. Now it's come from behind the fence. There's a thousand square meters of Japanese knotweed there, but obviously it's starting to cause a big problem now to the pavement. So IW on triangle, we can't prevent too late for the detection. So here we could, we, we considered an excavation of the pavement, perhaps down to a reduced level, not going down the full two meters, but maybe half a meter then using root barrier to uh, prevent any residual risings from coming up under, un, under the new pavement. And then obviously doing a herbicide program on the land adjoining it would simply have cost the client, the client could never have afforded a full excavation on this site. It wasn't going to happen. And cost is a big part of what we do, finding the economic uh, solution. And indeed the one that's also lowest in carbon emissions, we have to consider that as well. Again, this is a classic situation of a hard surface with Japanese not really going through it. It's hard, I mean, at the moment the slabs here are lifting, we can lift the slab to perhaps do a reduced level excavation, root barrier, herbicide treatment ongoing on the residual areas. Things are possible here, a bit more possible perhaps. And just to show that patching tarmac does not work. I love this picture, Japanese knotweed, someone decided to patch the tarmac because Japanese knotweed damage, Japanese knotweed just ignores and just goes through it anyway. Waste of time, you have to do a lot more than that. Now this is a site that I was on a few years ago now. Quite an old toilet block here. That's the square blocky thing painted in white and you've got six foot of Japanese knotweed growing out of the roof. Now what I suspect happened here was that the Japanese knotweed was there before they built the toilet block and it went into dormancy for quite a long time. Now Japanese knotweed will enter a non-growing phase quite readily if the situation is not uh, appropriate for it. So it's been covered up by a building or root barrier or perhaps been overdosed with herbicide. And it just doesn't grow for a few years. Then it will just emerge again when situations are right. Again, the IWN triangle here, prevention can't do that, early detection monitoring that's gone. Physical mechanical, yeah, you basically can knock the building down. That's pretty much where it is. Um, or you can do a herbicide program and perhaps to facilitate that, you can, where the building's actually been moved away from the boundary wall, it's actually a warehouse, the, the red brick wall, a, a, a listed structure as well. But the toilet box actually moved half an inch off its foundations, which you can't really see it very well. So you can possibly rake out some of the rhizomes from that gap just to reduce down the physical mass of the uh, knotweed, but it's still going to need ongoing herbicide program, whatever you do. Someone's back garden. Then a, a landlord had repossessed their property, found this. And when I say knotweed can cover multiple gardens, I mean, it can cover any number of gardens, really. Um, I've seen it cover 30 back gardens of a, a a terrace street or a back to backs. This one's actually covering five or six gardens and the other properties were not interested in collaborating or enabling their not to be treated in any meaningful way. There's no access for machinery in the, or in, into this garden. You have to take everything through the house. So you really are into a herbicide program with a little bit of physical work here just to cut down the dead canes in the winter to facilitate access. It's not easy or straightforward, particularly as in this case, the other gardens are untreated. It's just gonna keep on coming back. Now excavation, 
when I talk about excavation, we often use big machinery. And this is not something you just do because you feel like it, it needs a fair bit of planning. You can't do it, for example, near existing structures. You need good access for machinery. When you dig not weed, it's controlled waste. So we have to take it to scarce landfill. And not every landfill would accept controlled waste. So sometimes you have to move waste a long way. My records, I've got two long hauls that we, uh, I managed. One was from Cornwall up to Wiltshire, the other from Hackney in East London up to Tyneside. It just, it just was the combination of contaminants together with the Japanese knotweed that led to those very long hauls. Of course, your carbon footprint's very high and you can get cross-boundary issues still even on development sites. But I've used that just to illustrate why we can't excavate in smaller properties like a domestic house. It's just not viable in most instances. Now you can also do a burial on site, and we occasionally do this. Typically, to comply with the Environment Agency a guidance on this, you have to dig a cell. The cell has to be four or five metres deep. It has to be fully tanked with root barrier, and you have two metres as a minimum of clean fill on top of the final root barrier. Many problems on the development sites, however, you need a lot of space on site, high carbon footprints, cost is high, Got to be practical, you can't do this on every site. And you can't build houses or structures on, on the cell area either, it will subside. And you can't pile them on the cell either. Uh, bizarrely, a London council actually advocated people dig cells in their back garden for their Japanese knotweed. Yeah, just small town gardens. How they thought that was feasible, I've no idea. Now, what, what else can we do for, for an integrated solution? Well, we can. Uh, looking at as an alternative to herbicides, we can cap off Japanese knotweed on site. So in this instance, this is a housing development in Guernsey, we basically did a minimal dig, just digging out the minimum needed for the foundations, the footings, etc. Then we tanked, all, we capped off all the, all the knotweed using high quality root barrier with a guaranteed life of at least 50 years un underground. And the knotweed will then just eventually starve and die. 50 years, yeah, that's the recommendation. It should, it, it should be, it, and this technique is very robust. It's not without its problems though, you can't use it on every site. You can of course screen soil, this is quite big. A lot of companies do a fair bit of this. And you've got, but you have got significant limitations. It only really works when the soil is dry not if it's moist or wet, you only do it on some soil types, and it's not 100%. The screen soils will still contain viable elements of Japanese knotweed. Now, people say to me, surely to goodness, you know, these screens are 10 mil in size. Yeah, but what happens is the knotweed rhizomes actually go through these screens. It's a bit like if you cook spaghetti and put it in a sieve and shake the sieve, you'll get strands of spaghetti coming out of these sieve. Just, it is just like that. It's not cheap, it's expensive high carbon footprint. And there's one big problem with this. Uh, there has been a lot of unapproved use of herbicide on screen soils by some contractors. And by unapproved use, I mean a cocktail of six or eight different herbicides. It's not good. Now, if you're doing it legally, you've got to keep the screen soils on site. So typically we use them to form a bund on site. So any residual knot we can be spot treated with herbicide. So it's a very good technique. You extract most of the knotweed that can be sent off for incineration or possibly a burial, but it's much reduced from the original amount of soil that would have gone. The soil has been reused on site. We can spot treat the knotweed, minimal use of herbicide. That area can be landscaped, you know, and you will get rid of the knotweed relatively quickly, three to four years if you do it properly. You do need root barrier onto the bun. There's serious questions about that. So let's look at integrated weed management overall for Japanese knotweed. It is possible to prevent it from arriving on site in the first place. If you limit the opportunities for fly tipping, have good biosecurity, you can actually prevent the propagules from arriving or at least minimize their opportunities. So developers, for example, may very well wish to secure their sites when, after they purchase them to prevent fly tipping, etc., from introducing invasives on site. 
we try and encourage that. I know, obviously, if you detect an early infestation of Japanese knotweed, you can deal with it much more effectively. You know, you're not going to have such a big problem. But we're in the invasive weed, weed market, we're like the rat man. You don't call us in as a precautionary measure. You call a rat man in when you've got rats running around. We're like that. We get called in when there's a problem. So we usually only get involved when there's a significant problem on site. So you can actually kind of excavate knotweed fully or partially. You can treat them to a physical process to reduce the amount of biomass on site by screening, possibly by heat, although the column footprint again is high. And you can use root barrier. There's no effective biological control available at the moment. Uh, and there are limited herbicides available to us, and these take many years of treatment to achieve control and eradication. To give you a an example of that, we've got one site in West London, five hectares of knotweed. Yeah, 50,000 square metres. And we've been treating it now for 16 years, and I reckon we've got another 14 years to go before we actually will get rid of it. It's a huge problem, and it's not one that's going away overnight. So let's just change topic a wee bit. This is talk about Himalayan balsam very briefly. Now this picture, which I've included because it's so brilliant, this is actually a nature reserve near Birmingham. The, the green stuff in the front is Japanese knotweed. The lilac flowers behind are Himalayan balsam. Fields and fields and fields of both. It's a nature reserve. Yeah. So Himalayan balsam. It's an annual plant. It's just giant busy lizzie spread by seeds. It's no overwintering stage other than seeds. So you've actually, this actually gives you many more options for control or eradication using our IWM triangle. And here's a back garden, again in Birmingham. And uh, yeah, you can see gardens and gardens of Himalaya balsam. Let's look at this briefly. We can prevent, if you can prevent the seeds from spreading from an adjoining property or via watercourses, you're doing really well. In most cases, you're not going to be able to stop them. The seeds explode, the seeds are moved via water, flooding events, etc. So early detection monitoring is vital. If you can deal with the early infestation, the few dozen plants maybe that have arrived one spring, you can just deal with it by hitting it, basically. You can mow it out, you can hand pull, you can use a brush cutter, or you can just hit it with a big stick. It, it, it will be controlled that easily. There is a biological control available, so for large outbreaks such as that nature reserve, I recommend they actually talk about use talk to a cubby about using their biological control, which is a rust. It's got a few problems with the rust at the moment. They are looking to produce several different strains of this because we they found out we actually have several strains of, of Himalayan balsam. It's not just one straight species, and of course you can use herbicide, but other alternatives sh should be considered first. So every spring we get calls from parish councils wanting us to go in there and spray their Himalayan balsam. And I have to actually suggest to them that if they change their maintenance regime in these areas and mow them regularly, they won't have a problem with balsam or their balsam problem will be significantly reduced. That can be quite hard work. So, you know, I'm saying to them, well, realistically, rather than going in there with herbicide first, let's look at management change. But there. That's the, you know, they will just go to another contractor, I'm afraid. Now, briefly, we're going to talk about invasive bamboos, because this is very much the new kid on the block. Five, six years ago, not really on our radar. Now, very much they are. This is a, a invasive bamboo. It's broadleaf bamboo in Exmoor, growing nicely in the wild. So briefly, their main spread currently is from gardens, but also spreading in the wild through fly tipping and also to direct spread from gardens and from landscape schemes. Spread is vegetative through rhizomes, not through seeds yet. And there's quite a number of species that are aggressively spreading in the British Isles. It's not just one or two, it's a dozen or more. The impacts are similar to Japanese knotweed. You have large monocultures all interlinked through rhizomes very competitive, so not much else will grow in that, in that area, no wildlife, huge environmental impacts. It's actually a faster spread than not when established. And it's just as hard to control, it's just a bit different. So let's look at the culprits. Who and who really popularised bamboo as a garden plant? Alan Titchmarsh and Charlie Dimmock. I don't know whether they're my heroes or 
or my villains. I suspect they're my villains, really. Typical bamboo problem. It's coming from an adjoining property, coming up through the shed base, remove the shed, lift the slabs, all the bamboo rhizomes. So here you have to hand, after you have to hand dig it out. Really hard work. You can't do hand digging on a big scale. Those rhizomes are tough. This is someone's garden. Now, to take this picture, I have to stand on a big step ladder and hold my camera over my head. This bamboo is tall. The house behind is a three-story townhouse. Someone thought it would be a good idea to plant bamboo that goes to 25 to 30 foot around their garden. The neighbours in the six adjoining properties, once they realised they actually couldn't open their back doors, actually didn't think it was a good idea at all. Real problem here. Huge amount of biomass. Um, difficult to deal with in every, in every way. This site's still being treated under an ongoing programme of ours. And it's going to take a few more years yet, I think. So excavation and a bamboo. When I say it's tough, I mean, even a small excavator such as this will struggle to get it out of the ground. It's no surprise really if you think about it. Bamboo is after all used as scaffolding in parts of Asia or is even used for buildings or for other things like bicycle frames. And rhizomes are simply the solid stem, so they are tough. Now I'll just take a close look at this picture. See that bay window? We're going to have a little close look at the problem. Bamboo rhizomes. They find a hole, they want to go in it. And straight away, you've got building problems on this side. So you've got bamboo rhizomes going in. Now, I don't know if that, built, if that crack in the wall was there before the bamboo entered, or whether it's a result of the bamboo entering. It's impossible to say, really. But let's look at inside the property, shall we? Yeah. That's, that is the sort of problem that bamboo can do. It can get on the floorboards and come up in every room. And it doesn't necessarily come up near where it got into the building. Often it will travel 20 foot maybe into the house and come up behind the kitchen cupboards. It seems to like kitchens. So let's look at integrated weed management for bamboo. Prevention, don't plant it. It's being spread by planting. Don't plant it, don't fly to it. Early detection monitoring. It typically takes a number of years, five to 10, to establish before starting to run. You've actually got quite a good window of opportunity there to manage it. So you can use root barriers, you can prune the rhizomes to control it, to stop it from running. Unfortunately, that's not a common occurrence. So then we're into physical mechanical removal. Now, bamboo is really tough. Excavators struggle and hand digging is only possible for small areas. We are looking at an alternative approach, but I can't talk too much about it at the moment. Um, perhaps in a couple of years' time, I can come back to you about that. But it's a problem. Excavation is one of the hardest jobs we've ever known. I've known of quite a few companies that have tried, failed, and they've ended up calling us in, actually. We know, we, we know a bit more, and we've been doing it for a bit longer. Biological control, unless you've got Chi Chi's number in the bottom right-hand corner, there's none commercially available. Chemical. Yeah, glyphosate actually works reasonably well, but it does take a number of years to actually achieve eradication. It's not a quick solution at all. Typically, we have to do an integrated program here. We have to use both physical means, so we have to remove the canes in the first year and stomp inject as well. And we are looking at doing other things now, after the stumps after that, which might help. So yeah, there is a physical element to it as well to improve control. Here's one that you all are probably very much aware of, field horse tail. And our, our problems in Aminti are different, but I think similar and relatable to the problems in agriculture and commercial horticulture. Our main problems are, as you can see here, hard surface damage. We see a lot of this on new construction sites, new development sites, where the field horse tail has not been dealt with prior to the site being developed. And we also see a lot of this in people's gardens, when it's just run a mock, completely a mock, and they've got just a garden, a field horse tail. So what can we do? I mean, we can't, using our IWM triangle, prevention, no, early detection is past that, physical, mechanical, we can do a few things. Um, looking at the IWM, we can excavate, 
down to a depth of two meters. We can lift the pH maybe by liming. That can help to just move the goalpost slightly and make it a little bit less of a suitable env environment for real horse tail. We can cultivate the rhizome network, break it up, use root barriers under hard surface, improve drainage, or make site maintenance changes. There's not much to talk about with the biological side, I'm not aware of any, and herbicides are limited in their efficacy. Let's look at a summary then of integrated weed management for invasive weeds. Control of invasive weed plants is complicated, it's changing all the time. We are introducing new plants to the UK without any real control or impact studies. There's no effective controls on introducing new plant species, and the plant biology is not well understood by many in the industry anyway, and that leads to suboptimal management techniques. We've only got a few herbicides available. Resistance is a, is a concern at the moment. Biological controls are few, and generally, they're not that effective. Invasive weed management is often underfunded or even not funded at all by large landowners. You know, people buy a development site, they don't do anything with it for years, 10, 15, 20 years. They just sit on it, don't spend any money on it. If they've got Japanese knotweed, after 20 years, they've just got Japanese knotweed, haven't got any, any, anything else on site. Industry is reactive, not proactive, but we're the rat man. We're, we don't control the land. We're just called in when there's a problem. So I don't see how that's going to change. Cost-effective solutions are generally herbicide-based, with other solutions being very expensive and very carbon use intensive by comparison. That's a concern. We do need a lot more research to develop reliable IWN techniques for invasive weeds. At the moment, there's limited amounts of research being, are being done. A lot more needs to happen. Some of us are trying our best to develop things like I'm, I'm working on invasive bamboos and also invasive trees and, trees and shrubs in my own time. There's a copy of the book. It came out this year, Invasive Bamboos. I recommend it. Available in every good bookseller. Quick plug. Finally, if you're interested in this development site, it's a unique opportunity. You've got a rather large amount of Japanese knotweed on this site. All, basically all that tall green stuff is Japanese knotweed. It's filling probably three quarters of the site. That's a fairly typical, what I would call development sites. No one's actually caring for it. No one's doing any maintenance. They still want loads of money for it, even if it's full of invasive weeds and will cost a fortune now to remediate. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, the rat man of weed control. <laughs> <laughs> it was great to have an insight on the challenges and problems faced by the amenity sector, um, somewhat different to doing the, the agriculture sector, so it made a good change. Thank you. Right, now next up we've got Richard Hull, who's worked at Rothamsted Research for over 20 years now, and is currently employed as a weed science specialist in the Weed Ecology and Evolution Group. Uh, Richard has worked on a vast array of projects over the years, and he's got a current focus on herbicide resistance and integrated weed management. And he's now going to give us an update on IWM praise and what strategies and tactics are UK arable farmers employing for weed control. Thank you. Over to you, Richard. Uh, thanks, Nicola. Um, and as ever, people can put their questions in the, the Q&A. So hopefully my talk this afternoon will pull together some of the, the sort of threads and, and themes that have, um, some of the other speakers have spoken about. Um, this afternoon and this morning and specifically mine is another um, sort of case study using farmer interviews so similar to what Henry and Holly were talking about this morning um, and this forms part of a very large um, EU funded Horizon 2020 project um, which is called IWM Praise which stands for Integrated Weed Management Practical Solutions for Europe I believe I may have got that slightly wrong um, this project is really big. It has numerous work packages. This work um, just forms part of one of those work packages. Um, and it's also across uh, seven or eight different European countries as well. So really in this talk today, I've got a few objectives um, to show you some of the data that we've obtained from these interviews that I carried out with farmers um, a couple of years ago. Um, what are the main weed problems? I think you can probably guess what they are. What strategies and tactics are those farmers employing for weed control on their farm and on their land? 
Um, similar to what Henry and Holly were talking about this morning. So some of the drivers that, that sort of um, will impinge upon their, that decision-making process. And that kind of goes slightly hand in hand with some of the barriers to uptake of integrated weed management as well. And then finishing off with sort of, sort of trusted um, sources of information and knowledge um, of where these farmers um, got their information to make the changes and to make the decisions um, about integrated weed management on their farms. So similar to what you heard this morning, um, we had a, a protocol laid out. The protocol is the same for all of the European countries. We had the same sets of questions. This wasn't just done um, in the UK for arable um, across all of the European countries. Um, there was a whole mixture of arable, wide row crops, horticulture, vineyards, orchards, um, all of the questions and the protocol was exactly the same. And they were kind of split into four sections. So there was things about sort of who the farmer is, um, their age, land ownership can have a huge um, impact on how they can deal with weed problems, um, what problem weeds they had. The most important part that we were dealing with um, that we really wanted to know was what they were doing on their farm to control weeds that they have factors that affect their decision making process and where they um, access information to make those choices. So a bit like earlier, these were all um, interviews. Um, none of them were done face to face. They were predominantly done over the phone um, or on sort of platforms like this on Zoom or Teams. They were all recorded and they were all fully transcribed and modeled. Um, I'm not going to show you any of the modeling data um, that the colleagues in the Netherlands have been producing. Um, there isn't the time to go through that today. So just a quick thing about the farmers that we had. Um, they covered quite a large area um, of England. They range from sort of Gloucestershire over in the west to Essex and then north, south from Yorkshire down to Kent. Um, I would love to have actually spoken to farmers that I didn't know, so I had no sort of preconception about what they were doing for weed control or the weeds that they had. It's very difficult to get farmers that you have no prior contact with sometimes to actually agree to do these interviews. Um, some of them I didn't know what we're doing. Um, some of them are probably quite well known farmers if I actually had a list that you could see. So I would say that these are probably slightly more of the enlightened farmers. They are not a random set. Of, of people that I interviewed, but I think they do give quite a good snapshot of what farmers are doing um, currently um, in the UK. So what are the main weed issues that these farmers have? Um, obviously, black grass came out as the top. I had to use our BGRI network to try and, and make up some of the numbers for the farmers that we were interviewing. Um, so in the green bars, you will see these are the numbers of the farms um, that those weeds were present, or the farmers said that these weeds were present on their land. The bar in, or in yellow is where that, that weed is a major issue um, on their farm. Um, interestingly, that all of the major issues that they said were um, the grass weeds. Um, the one farm that said didn't have a major issue with black grass was the one farmer that I interviewed from Yorkshire but he had a problem with Italian ryegrass and brome instead. So all of the problem weeds that they said were, were the grass weeds. The ones that have got little uh, asterisks, asterisks um, sort of stars next to them, um, are predominantly issues that farmers have controlling these weeds in um, obviously row crops. Now, that's probably a little bit better with a few herbicides, one particular herbicide that's come along in the last couple of years. Um, but charlock in specifically um, is still a real challenge um, in OLC grape crops. Um, cleavers was a particular issue um, or present on most farms, but for most of the broadleaves weeds, we have a really good herbicide arsenal and a range of actives to control broadleaf weeds um, in the UK still. And of course, there is a much sort of smaller range of um, non-chemical control methods to control broadleaf weeds. So the next slide I'm going to show you is a sort of uh, 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 a diagram of the tactics that the farmers um, are, have employed in the UK that I interviewed for weed control in the UK. 
So this is, this is, these are all of the tactics that the farmers that I interviewed, the ones that they said that they actually do. So we actually had initially a larger list than this um, of things that they could be doing. So there are some things uh, that aren't on this list that we thought of. So there are things like mulches, there's intero cultivations. So using sort of new sensing technology and GPS. Um, and there are also things like sort of decision support systems, which none of the um, farmers I spoke to mentioned. So effectively what we have here is the bigger the lettering or the bigger the font size, the more farmers mentioned that as a tactic that they actually use for weed control. And you can probably quite easily see the main tactics that they're actually using here. So now some of the smaller um, sort of font sizes, you wouldn't have actually been able to see if I'd have made them their real size. So I've actually, some of the smaller ones I've made bigger just so you can see what they're actually, what those um, sort of groups are. And there's roughly five strategies that we sort of space these things in, out into. So there's one about sort of cropping systems in space and time, so that's rotations and cover crops. Sort of one around sort of cultivar choice and the establishment of that crop, field and soil management, targeted control, and then monitoring and evaluation. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these individually. Um, Alistair did a very good roundup this morning of a hell of a lot of these different tactics and strategies that farmers can employ. So really, I'll just go through very briefly and, and, and sort of the main things that, that farmers are doing. So the first one really, and Gary talked about it this morning, is rotation. Most need or every single farm rate said that they, dive, they had diversified their rotation over the last three to five years to combat the weed problems that they have and specifically black grass. They'd all altered their sowing dates, so that kind of goes hand in hand with rotation, where they were including more spring crops um, as part of their rotation, but also um, they were doing delayed autumn sowing as well. And I think all bar about two of the farmers I spoke to were increasing seed rates um, to try and make the crops that they put in the ground more competitive. Um, a few of them were choosing different uh, cultivar choices, specifically they were growing more competitive winter barleys, so either sort of six row or six row hybrids for that extra competition. I'm not going to talk too much about tillage and depth. Um, as part of the, the program, I did interview, uh, I think, four or five no-till farmers out of the 16, so about 25%. There was a whole range of different tillage methods that the farmers that I interviewed were doing, everything from uh, annual ploughing to rotational ploughing to sort of very shallow min-till to full sort of conservation ag or, or whatever phrase you want to use it as direct drilling. Um, all of them were, were using tillage um, to try and get on top of their grass weed problems. And again, it comes back to that diversity and when you use that particular tactic in which part of the rotation. Every farmer said that targeted control was really, really important. They all used glyphosate um, either in stubbles or stale seedbeds. They were all using pre-emergence herbicides, following that up in, in the autumn and then in the spring to try and catch um, some of the spring germinators or other grass weeds. Quite a large proportion were patch spraying out. That's predominantly for wild oats in the spring. Um, and quite a few of them were doing hand weeding. This was seen as a sign of success, um, that if you could get your populations down to a roadable level, that was a really, really good thing. And then finally, sort of monitoring and evaluation. As I said, nobody was using um, DSS or decision support systems, but the vast majority of the farmers were actually going out and looking to see how well the tactics that they'd employed or changed, what effect that they were having in the field on their populations. So I'm gonna kind of take a little bit of a sidetrack here and use some of the sort of case studies that we've gained from our Black Grass Resistance Initiative um, that was started back in uh, 2014. So this has been carried on. So the BGRI project um, ran for four years and has been part of a follow-on um, Innovate UK uh, project called AI Scope for the last couple of years. So we've carried on all of our mapping and assessing. And I thought I'd just give you a few sort of um, different 
approaches or, or not approaches that farmers are taking um, for black grass control um, across our network. So this first example, in each of the most of these next few slides, you will see these maps that are on the left hand side of the screen. These are our field maps that we go out and we um, produce every summer. We go and walk through as a team through the field. Um, we walk up and down the tram lines. We give uh, a assessment of the black grass density to the each of those grids is a 20 by 20 square meter grid. And we can build up these pictures of black grass density within that field, but also over time as well. So this is a particular field um, farm uh, near Doncaster. Uh, and this is a this farmer hasn't changed anything to his agronomy over the time that this field has been in um, the network. So the darker the colour, the darker the red, the higher the abundance of black grass in, its, in those fields. And he is very much sticking to a, a sort of a wheat, obviously rape or wheat, wheat rape um, uh, rotation. So he's still got very, very high levels of black grass in his field. The picture on the right um, is the picture that we took this year where we went out and um, uh, assessed it again in the summer this year. I mean, it was absolutely rammed. So this is a good example of, of where a farmer um, still has the same levels of controls um, of his black grass population and he hasn't made any changes. This next, the next examples are really where um, farmers have made changes and they've made massive impacts into their black grass populations. So this is a particular field in Oxfordshire. So on the left hand side of the screen, you'll see what the, the field looked like when we first visited in 2014 and then what it looks like when we went back four years later to assess in 2018. This is what the abundance maps look like um, between those two time periods. So there's still black grass there in 2018, but it's at a very low level. There was about a plant every one or two square meters in that field. So this farmer um, had put that field down to grass for 18 months and had then done two spring crops. And then when we went back and assessed it in the preceding winter wheat crop after that. So he's done a very good job by changing his rotation, including sort of spring cropping and grass lays, quite drastic measure to get on top of his black grass population. But this farmer is still um, reliant on really good herbicide control as well. So this field is actually the one that's sort of behind and up the hill a little bit from where that field is. Um, it's in the same rotation. Um, we know from his uh, agronomy records that this field, the field opposite, which was um, identical, had only had a sort of flufenicet based pre-emergence herbicide. And this is a, a mist strip in that particular field. And you can see the level of control um, that he's getting from these sort of residual herbicides. So all of the farmers are still using um, quite a lot of residual chemistry and glyphosate pre-drilling. Herbicides still remain a vital part of our integrated weed management strategies in sort of conventional farming. So this is another example of where uh, a different IWN or different non-chemical strategy, this is a field in Bedfordshire. Um, he had fairly low levels of black grass um, in, his, in his field, but he had quite a lot, some sort of areas of sort of high black grass came in in 2018. Um, the conditions were perfect that summer for him to plough. So he put it back into winter wheat. Um, we went back out that year and assessed it. And again, there was in most places of that field, there was only a plant every two or three meters. So this is a really good example of where uh, rotational plowing, he doesn't plow every year. Normally he's fairly min till to a, a shallow depth, but he does use the plow as a reset button every so often, but he only does it when he can actually do a really good job of inverting the soil. So this is a really good example um, of where plowing can actually help um, in this type of situation. And then I thought I'd finish just with two, two more examples um, of where the farmers have uh, changed their rotation um, to get on top of um, black grass problems. So the field, the sort of collection of maps on the left hand side, again, this is from Bedfordshire, was probably the worst field that we went to in 2014. Um, and then you can see the progression of the densities with the different crops over time. Um, and we were struggling to find plants in that field 
just sporadic plants here and there when we went back in the summer of 2020 um, to that particular field. So he's changed his rotation completely from a sort of wheat, wheat rape, wheat, wheat rape rotation to include um, a lot more spring cropping and hybrid barleys into his rotation. The field on the right hand side um, is one from Oxfordshire. Um, this farmer is on very heavy clay um, and his main control measure now for um, getting on top of black grass is he has about 50% of his land down to spring crops, either spring barley or spring beans every year. Um, and he's done a really good job. That seems to have done a fantastic job at reducing um, his black grass burden. I think in the field, which is the bottom right, when we went into the spring barley in 2020, we found two plants in that one little sector. So he's done a fantastic job of reducing um, his black grass abundance through um, the use of spring cropping. So really to summarize what the, the farmers are doing um, for weed control, um, and Gary really mentioned this quite a few times in his talk this morning, and it's diversity is the key to sustainable weed control and having flexibility in your system. So everything really comes from having a di as diverse rotation and different crops as possible. And then leading on from that, having a range of drilling dates in the autumn, maybe even delayed drilling in the autumn and having crops in the spring. Cultivations, having a nice diverse range or whatever works on your soil type. And then as a consequence of having that really diverse rotation, you're using herbicides with lots of different modes of action because you're growing different crops. You're not relying on the same modes of action sort of year after year. And I've shown this slide before at other meetings in the past, and this time I've added monitoring. I think we really need to sort of make sure this is a really big thing moving forward. And it might be easier with technology through the use of drones and other camera technologies that we can actually evaluate how well these um, IWM measures um, are working in the field. So to finish, I thought I would go back to the survey and to sort of highlight some of the points that Henry and Holly um, uh, put forward this morning. So we also asked our farmers um, what factors affect their decision-making process. So we put these into sort of six categories. So the lower the number, the higher the priority that is for, fact, for the, that factor affects their decision-making process. So the biggest factor was economic, the lowest factor on their scale was social or cultural ones. And these really back up the findings that from Holly's and Henry's survey that they showed this morning. And for me, the economic one is sort of, is, is twofold. They are making changes because the weed control, the, the black grass specifically on their farms has got out of control and is hitting margins and profit. But it also has another impact of what they can actually do. What changes can they make? And can they still make their farm profitable in the future? I mentioned earlier about land ownership. So most of these farmers that I spoke to do own their own land. Um, some of them have a little bit of land which is rented um, and that can have big impact on how you manage that land if you're only on five or 10 year rents. Will you, you, will you look after that land in the same way as if it's your own land and you can make sort of long term decision making? And similar to Henry and Holly's thing that they, they showed this morning, so we had another category, which is sort of biophysical, which is sort of environmental factors. So this is things, how, what their, how their soil type affects what they do, um, the weather. Um, all the farmers thought that was a really important thing. Some of them thought that they couldn't really affect what the weather could do or what the weather, the impact that the weather had um, too much. Um, but they all thought it was a really, really important um, factor. And then finally, um, we asked them all about sort of um, where they get, where they have trusted sources of information. Now, I, I should say, because this was a European project, the one at the end, we kind of ignore um, contract workers because this was put in for olive growers in Italy where the, the contract workers do everything for the growers. So I will ignore that one at the end. And roughly these go into sort of, two or three different categories. So again, the lower the number, the more important it was to the farmers that I spoke to. And, and you've almost got a sort of range of, of 
sort of activities or clubs that they go to. So the first five things there, I really think you can almost sort of band together and call it almost sort of independent peer-to-peer -peer learning. All of the farmers I spoke to loved independent advice. Um, I think that was key um, and sort of unbiased opinions. They love going to farm in sort of information days, sort of farm trials, um, speaking with farmers, learning from them, study clubs. So I think all of those first five things come together. And then the other sort of six things were a bit more sort of polarizing. Some of the farmers love social media, some of them didn't do it at all. Um, some of them um, were basis trained, so they had a very high level of education about what they could be doing. So they were in a position to challenge uh, what their agronomists were telling them. Um, but there was a bit more sort of a, a larger range of responses. I think it's those five, first five things on there, um, sort of experience at farms, going to, to field days, hearing from independent experts, unbiased opinions. That was the sources of information that the farmers that I spoke to um, got the most from. And I think that came out in Henry and Holly's talk this morning. So just to summarise this, that's, that's a very quick uh, sort of whistle stop tour through some of the work that we've been doing on I IWM Praise and on our sort of BGRI project. But for me, integrated weed management, as say Gary said it this morning, it's having diversity and flexibility, looking at lots of different control measures uh, and, and integrating those together to try and get on top of the weed problems that we have. I think we, we will be monitoring um, the success of these tactics that are employed more in the future as technologies come on board and that will make that much easier. Um, economics, I think we have to try and package everything that we say um, with a certain economic element because farmers are businesses at the end of the day, they need to make money. So we need to make sure that these strategies and tactics um, are viable long-term and are not gonna damage profitability too much in the short term. And I think we've always, I think we've become slightly wiser about the sources of information um, and places to get that across that um, farmers trust and want us to provide going forward. Um, and that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. It's good to hear that your findings conclude with others that we've heard earlier on today. We've now got time for a, a short Q&A session, so if this afternoon's speakers could put their cameras back on, please. That's great, thank you. Right, we'll start off, we've got one for Helen here. Um, regarding CO2, uh, would ploughing be worse than chemical weed control options, do you think? That's a, a tricky one. Um, I mean, I'm not a soil scientist, so I can't really comment so much on, on that aspect of it. Um, but yeah, we did. We found generally that the, the plowing option was best with the weed control, which I think we can all sort of agree on generally. But um, yeah, the other implications of switching from minimum tillage to plowing need to be explored further. Um, I think generally it's, it's going to be more a, an issue with soil structure um, than necessarily uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, okay. Um, Brian, do homeowners who plant bamboo, which then spreads, do they have they got a legal obligation to control it in neighbours' gardens and properties? Who would pay for that? It's a very interesting question. Um, essentially, if you allow any plant to spread into your neighbour's garden, you are causing what they call a nuisance under common law. So yes, you can be held liable for any costs. And these costs can be quite high. Okay. And Richard, in your survey, did any farmer mention bringing a grass or herbal lay into the arable rotation as part of their um, integrated weed management practices? Um, not specifically on the on the farmer survey. We do have farmers on the BGRI network um, that have had two to five year grass lays, um, just taking the fields completely out of production and okay. to get on top of, yeah, bad, really, really severe issues. All right, thank you. Um, Helen, in some of your slides, you said that glyphosate was environmentally damaging. Um, how was this measured? Because um, its use uh, allows regenerative agriculture, which has got many uh, varied environmental benefits. 
Yeah, yeah. It's the the measure that I was including in in these results was actually um, an environmental impact quotient, which is to do with the ecotoxicity of the chemical, right? And not the the practices associated with that chemical. So it's purely the um, the toxicity to different organisms, um, uh, coupled a little bit with the the risk of that chemical getting into water courses. Okay, so it's like the ecotox profile of the yeah yeah. Yeah, so actually the glyphosate itself is relatively benign compared to other chemicals. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you remove one chemical from the programme, then the overall toxicity does go down slightly. Yeah, yeah. Um, Another one for Helen. Has the issue of perennial weeds such as cooch, um, a major issue pre-glyphosate, been considered sort of in a post-glyphosate world? Yeah, so our model is only for annual weeds. Um, Right. We haven't looked at perennials in, in this system yet. Um, but yeah, obviously that's kind of, if you if you sort of make space for, for the perennial weeds to, to come through, then obviously there's going to be issues associated. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the model is only, only for annual weeds currently. Okay. Is there any plans to extend it or will it just be for annuals? Uh, yeah, it's kind of a, a pipe dream <laughs> point. Uh, it's quite different because obviously we're, we can model like all annual plants in the same way, like the life cycle, so matches to each other. Um, and it's it's quite nice to tie that in with the crop life cycle. Mm. Obviously, we've, we've introduced grass lays into the into the model, so we do have perennial crops in there now. So yeah, yeah, the next step would be to include perennial weeds. Yeah, okay. Another one for Brian. Uh, what is the situation regarding the, the role of a far a farlier? It's a dory in the management of Japanese knotweed. Right, the psyllid Aphalaria itadori was introduced about 10, 12 years ago, I think, into the UK. Um, and it's introduced as a biological control just to reduce the vigour of Japanese knotweed and to reduce the spread. It's not, in fairness, it's not been a great success. The strain that's introduced hasn't been, hasn't proved to be hardy enough. It doesn't like the British Isles, we're too cold, too wet. So Cabi are, are introducing hardier strains of, of the psyllid, and it's hoped that will have a greater impact in future years. But it's not going to kill the Japanese knotweed, it's only going to reduce the vigour and put it more into balance in the natural environment. That's the theory and, and the hope long term. Okay, thank you. Um, another one for Richard. Um, did farmers that use lays get um, more issue, issues with um, Italian ryegrass? Not that I've seen. I have to admit, on our farm network, we have very, very few other weed species or grass species that are real issues on there. We have the odd, we have one really bad field of Ryle Meadow Brome, which is down in Oxfordshire. Um, but generally, we don't see that many issues with Italian ryegrass. They are, they seem to be spreading slightly out from the sort of areas in sort of Essex and Kent, where the sort of they've always traditionally been, uh, but not really. We do occasionally see perennial ryegrass where it comes out of a grass lay, um, but really Italian, on, on our network, whatever the farmers are doing for black grass control seems to be doing a really good job in general of keeping um, Italian ryegrass at bay. But our network isn't in those hotspots um, okay. where Italian ryegrass has, has thrived. Okay, another one for Helen, please. Uh, when you showed lower food production in the rotation with where you had more grass lays, was an allowance made for the uh, calories going into animal production from the grass, or are these calories uh, sort of lost when there's, there's grass in the rotation? Yeah, we we purely considered the the arable food crops, so we didn't um, assign any food production or profits to the grass lays. We okay, so, so there's no account made for sort of like meat or milk that might have come from no. from those grass. Yeah. Um, for Brian, will phytosanitary regulation or border controls be considered as part of IWM for invasive species in the UK? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, the phytosanitary measures deal with unintended hitchhikers, if you like, <coughs> as opposed to the plants themselves. At the moment, there is no effective control on introducing new plants. So as long as the plant hasn't got unintended hitchhikers, it's not really covered. Pardon me. <coughs> Pardon me. 
And uh, another one for you, has integrated weed management with chemicals and electrical treatment been investigated? Um, I've not seen any published uh, literature on that. Okay. I'd quite like to, but I haven't seen it. <laughs> not been done yet. Yeah. Uh, Richard, what factors affect farmers' decision making? Um, obviously, societal and cultural is the biggest influence. Is this linked to, to um, government policy, or is it just societal opinions? So it's so it's actually the other way around. So on those okay. graphs, yeah. the yeah, the sort of I got all the farmers to to rank them from one to six, one being the most important. So the lower the number, the more important it was. Um, maybe I should change them round the other way. So the bigger number is the most important. Okay. <laughs> um, one for Helen. In some respects, it would appear counterintuitive that spring cropping would have less environmental benefits than some other options, as things as spring germinating weeds, including polygonum species, have nutritional um, benefits to arthropods and birds. Uh, you mentioned that farm A was dominated by poa annua. Were broadleaf weeds uh, deficient in the model? The, the environmental impact, as I said before, was on the ecotoxicity, so the spring okay. was particularly yeah. bad for the toxicity. Mm -hmm. uh, we did look at the diversity of the weed community, um, and that came out particularly well in all of the IWM scenarios. Um, so everything except for the glyphosate scenario had really high uh, diversity of the weed community um, is something that that in the next steps we would sort of like to link through to the diversity of uh, other trophic levels um, mm -hmm. like that. But yeah, the spring cropping scenario and also the grass lay scenario did very very well in terms of weed diversity. Yeah, is, is that the reason why Helen that the yields weren't that much lower? So you had a greater yeah. sort of weed diversity that was kind of reducing the impact of sort of any pernicious weeds that would be yes yeah, so although the abundance was really high it was it was a diverse community and so there was very little impact on on crop production because there wasn't um, a huge level of competition despite high abundances yeah. yeah and a final one do you plan to include current and future income streams from elms similar in in the models for profitability yeah so all the profit that we included was purely from uh selling crop yield mm -hmm. but yeah if, if there's sort of options there to for like I said for linking the wheat diversity through to other trophy levels and things like that um, we could sort of attach some payments associated with that um, and include that in the profit calculation and yeah that's really interesting okay thank you um I think we we'll leave it there for the Q and A session. I'll try and do a sort of like a, a brief roundup of, of the day, <laughs> just quickly. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so, just to recap on on today's um, weed review, we started off with a roundup of the weather for last year from Peter. Um, in short, we've had an unsettled year overall, not particularly warm. And the standout feature was the cold and dry April, followed by a cold and wet May, and this led to delayed crop growth and problems for spring crop establishment. We then moved on to Alistair Leake, who gave us an oversight of his experiences of 30 years of farming system from mixed organic, stockless, organic arable, um, integrated farm management, um, maximizing production and conventional farming, and finishing up with conservation and regenerative agriculture. And very briefly, the conclusions are that um, diverse crop rotations assist in crop management, weed populations interact with rotations and soil cultivations, Field history is very important when it comes to weed pressure and grass lays are valuable in reducing short lived arable weeds and overall multiple control strategies give a stepwise approach to weed management. Gary Willoughby then gave us a practitioner perspective. Gary said he was not sure what to label himself as, but he goes with what feels best and he uses a whole farm approach to integrated weed management. He said that not moving soil is key and he highlighted the importance of drainage though it is a big investment, uh, subsoiling and ploughing only marks the problem and drainage is the key factor. And Gary on his farm uses rotation, drainage, minimal soil disturbance, cover cropping, all in the name of soil health. Uh, we then moved on to Holly and Henry, who share the tool for measuring IPM uptake amongst farmers and highlighted that adopters of IPM methods use more prevention measures, uh, considered more factors when planning and were more likely to be members of discussion groups. Uh, 
economic and environmental were the most cited as drivers to use IPM advice and or guidance. And key barriers to the uptake of IPM practices were um, economic or lack of knowledge or understanding of IPM and also mindset or, or habits. Uh, we then had a session on seed certification from Stephen Flack and Richard Barnes. Um, we learned that standards for content of weed seeds and other crop seeds are mainly achieved by seed testing methods. Um, there were relatively few field standards for the presence of other species of plants in the seed production field. A field inspection mostly is concerned with a variety of identity and, and purity, though there are exceptions. For example, there's zero tolerance for the presence of wild oats. Um, since the beginning of this year, agricultural seed brought into the UK can no longer be certified and labelled under the EU seed schemes, and it now has to be certified under the OECD seed schemes. And farm seed seed has no compulsory seed test or maximum permitted levels of weeds or other seeds, so it's important to test. And he also covered the risk from internet seed sales. Uh, Richard unfortunately has some technical issues with his slide. Um, deck um, from one of the hazards of presenting virtually but he did talk us through some of this seed activities as king seeds and his slides we put onto the bcpc website shortly so you'll be able to, to go over the, the the actual slides there if you'd like to at a later date but he covered evolving sectors things such as cover crops catch crops companion crops um, different ipm management options and addressing things such as soilborne pests using cover crops to work with nematodes in control problems I went and had a poster session over lunch and then this afternoon just to recap we've had Helen um, talking about the modeling effects of glyphosate loss in low-till and plow-based systems um, with simulated examples from two minimum till, till farms one which had a starting point of no herbicide resistance and one which is dominated by herbicide resistance black grass and simulated with and without glyphosate and different integrated weed management practices uh, glyphosate use significantly improves weed control compared to the IWM options. However, the downstream effects, including food production and profit, can be mitigated through IWM. Um, we then moved on to Brian, who um, gave us an update on IWM and amenity. Um, control of invasive weeds and plants is complex and is sort of challenging in this area. There are no effective controls on introducing new plant species into the UK. Plant biology is not well understood by many in this sector of the industry, um, often leading to suboptimal management techniques. There are a few herbicides available and resistance is an issue. Biological control options are few and often ineffective. Um, IWM is often underfunded or not even funded at all by the large landowners. The industry tends to be reactive, not proactive. And Brian thinks it's difficult to see how this will change. The most cost-effective solutions are generally herbicide-based, with other solutions being very expensive and very uh, carbon footprint unfriendly um, in, in terms in comparison with, with herbicide use. So much more research is needed to develop reliable integrated weed management techniques um, in, in this sector. And then we've just finished up with Richard, who um, gave us a summary of what IWM tactics UK arable farmers are using by the IWM Praise Project Survey, and also an update on the BGRI project. And Richard's um, survey used interviews to determine what are the problem weeds and strategies and tactics being employed by UK farmers, what are the drivers for decision making, and the barriers to the uptake of IWM. And similar findings to, to the um, results from this morning, farmers are using a range of tactics uh, to reduce the impact of weeds on the crop, reduce seed return and prevent weed establishment. Um, herbicides are still a vital part of the IWN strategy, but diversity and flexibility are key to integrated weed management. And what came out was that independent peer-to-peer -peer advice is very valuable for farmers and also economics, integrated weed management needs to be viable for farmers to, to take it up. Let me just share my screen again to finish. Um, so I'd like to thank all of the speakers um, for uh, 
preparing their slides and giving their talks today and giving up their time. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors who are up on the screen here. I would uh, like to say a big thank you to um, Myra Hart of Dupont Marketing and Julian Westaway of BCPC for all their hard work behind the scenes, sort of sending out invitations, organising the website, organising and running the webinar. Uh, thank you to uh, Lynn Tatnell and Richard Howell who've been helping monitor the, the questions for the session. And lastly, I'd like to say that we um, have got a short feedback survey. If you could um, complete that, that would be very helpful for us with planning the, the next um, weed review. And so there's a link on the slide here, or there's a QR code. You can point your uh, camera at the QR code and take you straight to the link. Uh, I'd like to finish up by saying that there's um, CPD points available for, for attending today. So there's five basis points and four Enroso points, and Moira has already sent out details of, of how you can claim those. And lastly, um, Neil Evans has put this in the chat, but he's also asked me to, to do a plug for him, but there's a, a VI webinar next Wednesday at 4 p.m. on propisomized product and pest management. He's put the details in the chat, and I'm sure you can get them through the VI website as well. So with that, I would like to, um, to close the session. Thank you very much for your attention and attendance today. Thank you again to all our speakers and sponsors. Thank you.